am uh, Chair Emily Kite and would like to welcome you to the, a, the May 2023 Historic Resources Commission meeting. The HRC is a quasi-judicial body that is governed by the North Carolina General Statutes, the City of Asheville's Unified Development Ordinance, and Buncombe County Ordinance. We are authorized to hear requests for certificates of appropriateness for alterations, demolitions, new construction, and other work within historic districts, or for the alteration and demolition of historic landmarks and other duties, including preliminary review of subdivisions as specified in the ordinances for the HRC. I will now ask our commission members and staff to introduce themselves. We'll start down at this, at this end. Oh, Leslie Carey, I've got a master's degree in history. Amy Moxley, architect. Sue Oliva, historian, American historian. Emily Kite, local architect. Emily Sprang, a master's degree in historic preservation, and I work in residential design and construction. Will Hornaday, Albemarle Park. Maria de Sassi, architect. Alexander Ellenbogen, architect. Chris German, architect. Janice Ashley, legal advisor to the HRC. Alex Cole, staff to the HRC. Okay. Uh, first up, we're going to consider the minutes from the April meeting of the HRC. The minutes include findings of fact and conclusions of law. Are there any corrections? Is there a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, we are going to begin our evidentiary hearings for the items listed on our agenda. As a quasi-judicial proceeding, the HRC is not setting policy, nor are we soliciting public opinion on the desirability of an application. The HRC hears and considers evidence presented and applies the standards set forth in the guidelines and standards for the specific historic district for that application. The HRC must make its decision upon competent, material, and substantial evidence to determine the facts of the hearing. The HRC will use judgment and discretion to apply the standards contained in the relevant guidelines to the facts. The commissioners, in voting for an item, will not have a fixed opinion that's not susceptible to change, will not have a conflict of interest, and will not have engaged in ex parte communication regarding the application. Following are the rules for speaking. This meeting is open to the public, but participation is, list, is limited to interested parties who wish, who wish to provide comment and testimony regarding the proposal. If you will be speaking as a witness, please focus on the facts and how they relate to the relevant historic district standards and guidelines, not personal preference or opinion. Witnesses must swear or affirm their testimony. At this time, I will administer the oath for all individuals who intend to provide witness testimony today. So if you plan to speak um, on behalf of an application, if you'll please stand and come to the front today. If you plan to speak, stand up. You'll, uh, please raise your right hand. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the information you present during the hearing for a certificate of appropriateness or preliminary subdivision approval before the Historic Resources Commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Do you? Thank you. Thank you. Oops. Okay. Uh, we will move to the first public hearing item on our agenda. I think we've got a continuance for the first application. Is that correct? Um, it was already continued. Okay. So then we don't need to do anything to that. Um, and so the first item on our agenda is new business in Montford at 6 Birch Street. We're going to start with a staff presentation from Alex. Thank you, Chair Kite and members of the commission. Uh, this first item, I'm gonna try to, we have a lot to get through today, so the first few items are, are pretty, um, I think, straight and to the point. So um, the first item is uh, 6 Birch Street 
Uh, it's a little one-story bungalow. Um, the applicant is proposing to remove this side bump out that's on the east elevation. It's not original to the structure that um, added the Sanborn map to your folder. Um, and there's a, um, I didn't include the photo on my slides, but there's a photo um, that was submitted with the application that shows an interior shot. It's kind of a weird little porch add-on. And um, there's a doorway within it that they'd like to also um, remo remove the door and um, close in the opening. I imagine that there p could have been a window opening in that location previously, um, but I'm not noting any concerns about them um, filling the opening with siding if they don't want to have an opening on that side of the house or in that particular location. So that's really the gist of this proposal. The siding in the, in the infill will match the existing lap siding. Um, yeah, any questions for me on this application? Any questions? Okay. Is the applicant here? Yes. Okay, y'all would like to come forward and say anything else about the application? Um, I have your, um, if you want to show anything that I didn't show, your okay. packet is here. We just kind of split them up, so. Okay. And before you, you before you all speak, this is, will be true really for all the applications. If you'll just state your name into the microphone before you speak, that'll just help us with our minutes later. Sure, it's Daniel Best. Yeah. I'm not sure I have much to add. Um, I was told by Alex that the uh, bump out wasn't original to the house. It's very dilapidated. Um, it's held up by two stilts. It's structurally unsound. One of the stilts isn't still attached to the concrete, so you can literally pull the stilt off the, the foundation entirely. Um, we, we had received two quotes. At one point, we thought, well, maybe we'll rebuild it, but we're about three feet from a property line at that point. Um, and even if we could rebuild it, it, it we got a quote of about $20,000 to rebuild that. And, it's not a, a porch that we really are getting a lot of use out of. So I think our best bet would be to, to tear it down. Yeah. And if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to, to answer them. Any questions? So. Okay. Um, we are going to open the floor for public comment. Okay. <coughs> Seeing none, we'll close the floor for public comment. Commissioners, other comments or questions? Silence mean we're ready for a motion. Yep, go ahead. Uh, Madam Chair, based upon the evidence presented to this commission, including Exhibit A, application, two pages. Exhibit B, photos of subject property, three pages. Exhibit C, parcel map. Exhibit D, 1951 Sanborn fire insurance map. And the commission's actual inspection and review of subject property by all members, except I move that this commission approve the certificate of appropriateness based on the following. One. That the application is to remove non-original, non-historic porch and door on east elevation. Area where porch and door are being removed will be infilled and finished with wood German siding matching existing in material, dimension, and color. All work will be in accordance with attached and approved drawings and plans. All permits, variances, or approvals as required by law must be obtained before work may commence. Two, that the standards for porches, entrances, and balconies found on pages 72 to 73 Windows and doors on pages 84 to 85, and materials uh, wood on pages 66 to 67 of the Montford Historic District Design Review Standards, adopted on April 14, 2010, and amended December 9, 2019, were used to evaluate this request. This application does meet the design standards for the following reasons. A. Porch being removed is not original or historic to the structure and is on a side elevation. B. Door being removed is not original to the structure and is on a non-character defining facade. C. Door opening to be filled in is not original and is a non-character defining facade. D. New siding will be wood matching existing in design, dimension, material, pattern, detail, and texture. Four, that the action and improvements proposed in the application before us for a certificate of appropriateness are congruous with the special historic character of the Montford Historic District. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Based upon the foregoing findings and for the reasons set forth therein, I move that a certificate of appropriateness be issued. A second? A second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving to the next item on our agenda, we're going to six Cum 60, excuse me, 60 Cumberland Avenue, also in Montford. Okay, um, this application is for a um, second story addition on the rear elevation. Here's some photographs of the structure in question. Um, it's a two-story house on Cumberland Avenue. Um, top two photos are obviously the front elevation. Uh, bottom the left is the north elevation and then looking at the, the rear. So just to give a little bit of history of this structure, um, and I've got those site plans and elevation drawings in here as well, but just to give a little bit of context to this, um, this property at some point, a one-story carport, as it was called in our file, was tacked onto the back of this house, maybe in the 50s or 60s it looked like from the photos that we have. Um, and they got approval back in, and it, it was in the same footprint as the existing addition that's on the back of the house. So they got approval back in, I want to say, 2006, 2007, um, to build the, the addition that's there now. Um, and I think the commission agreed that it could didn't have to be inset. Maybe the standards were slightly different then. Um, but I think they agreed that it could be in the same footprint as that carport that it had been built on. I say it's a carport, but it really was almost like a sh like a, a porch without any screening around it. It's kind of interesting. It was a little more formal than what we think of when we think of carports, I guess. Um, so in any case, there's an existing one-story addition on the back of the house um, that you can see in the in the site plan as well as the existing elevations, um, and they're proposing just to construct directly on top of it, um, which will necessitate the um, removal of the kitchen chimney on the back of the house. <clears throat> um, and it will just extend directly on top of the existing addition. So they're matching all the windows. There, there is that little, um, they're in the, in the decorative vent that's coming off of, or kind of mimicking the vent that's on the gable end with the vent that's on the front of the house. They're mimicking that, but they're proposing some um, custom glass within that vent. I don't really have a strong feeling about that one way or another since it's on the rear elevation. Um, it's, you know, not something that would be common on the historic house, obviously, but I, um, I understand that they want to get as much light within that space as possible. So um, that's just a note on, on kind of the only thing that's a little bit um, funky or odd about this particular proposal, but I'm not noting any concerns on my end. I think so. I mean, it's not a small or super insubstantial chimney like some kitchen chimneys we see, but it's not doesn't match the chimney that's towards the front of the house, and it's not as big, and you you cannot see it from the street. It's not it's not a very noticeable chimney. I, I'm kind of personally attached to chimneys, so I hate to see any chimney. <laughs> But I recognize that, you know, certainly there's a practical side where it's a secondary chimney and it's not a character-defining chimney, then certainly that's within the guidelines to be able to remove them. Other questions for Alex? Okay. Uh, is the applicant here? We lost our... I've got all your plans. If you need me to show anything else from your application, just let me know. Okay. I can help you out. Okay. Hi, my name is Drew Cornett. I am the one of the homeowners. My wife's other. She's not here with us today. Um, we fell in love with this house about a year ago, moved to Asheville from Atlanta, and we're excited to contribute to the history and the beautification of the neighborhood. Um, I don't really have anything to add on top of what Alex said other than you know, the, we love the house, but it, it lacks modern closets and modern bathrooms and such. So we're, we're going to have an opportunity to do that and put it back to something that looks like it was original as opposed to a house with a bump out on the back. So we're excited about that as well. This is uh, my contractor, uh, John Olip. 
as well. So we can answer any questions y'all might have. Questions for the applicant? Did you look at any window, the windows on that new addition on the uh, north facing side or south facing side where there's a lack of them? Was there no space for windows or did you look at windowing there? Uh, basically, should be on that side. Um, the designer isn't, wasn't able to be here with us today. So I believe what he was trying to do is obtain as much wall space within that, that room as possible. But are you talking about on the, the back of the house on the second floor or first floor? It's like both the side floors. Of the, side of the house. Speaking of, there's no windows in this space. So yeah, they didn't obviously when they did the finish out yeah. or the yeah. retrofit of the shed, there wasn't one there. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm yeah, there, sure. there wasn't one there uh, on the lower. There's not one currently on the lower, so the yeah, the addition would just match the lower. It looks like that's closet space. On the yeah, it's it's just gonna be a closet, so the window would go into a closet. <laughs> okay, thank you. Sure. Avery, I can get no, nothing will just, it just spins. Same, same with mine. And so I am having a hard time accessing the things in the folder. Yeah. I'm glad I somebody else is like, you can have Yes. This looks like kind of fish scale shingles that are trying to be matched on the second level. What, what's the availability of this? So what they, the shingles that are existing I don't, I believe there are just three tabs that are on there now, not 100%. So that's readily available. Yeah, so those are readily available. Yeah. We're basically, I pretty sure we were planning on replacing all the shingles because of the tie-in with the existing, basically there's only gonna be you know, two thirds-ish of the roof that be the original. Because of the removal of the old dormer, that is there now and such where basically that whole side of the house is going to need to be replaced so the plan was to replace um, all the shingles i was talking about this. oh oh i'm sorry so what they've done on the addition are the newer um style of what we call the cedar shingles because shingles are on the wall but they're they're machine cut i've been looking into getting hand cut shape which are technically for the roof but trying to get them to make a better match as opposed to what the the places where they tied in a, a little bit is and you can see the difference between the existing and the new i've been researching trying to find hand cut shingles to match the existing as best as possible so i haven't gotten my hands on those because they're 200 dollars a bundle and we're still in the design process so i have to get an actual bundle but we're, the intent is to match the, you know, the same, I think they're all pretty much the same size as well, to match the existing with a true hand split cedar shingle. Is there an opportunity to salvage what's on the house where you're going to be covering so it up? What we're taking off is from the addition. So it's all hand or it's all machine cut. Ah, so they, it's it an obvious, when match. you walk up, you can see the difference. It doesn't match right now. And we, I'm in the process of trying to find true hand split to match what was original. Even on the upper floor of the, uh, the second floor of the main house? I realize there's roof that hits some of that, so there's there, not a ton of shingles there anyway. There's probably not a lot that can be salvaged, because yeah. honestly, most of the lower ones are all rotted because mm -hmm. the way they did the addition, oh, yeah, they, they made themselves a really tall ceiling. So the addition has, you know, really, the ceiling the goes up of the shed. almost four feet, five feet from the roof. So what's there is all rain splattered and rotten. <laughs> and it's half, you know, windows back there. So yeah. like, it, yeah, there's yes. A, there's so there's not window. enough to do the whole There's side definitely window. not enough to do the whole side. Oh, no. If they're in a condition to. Um, so it seems like at some point we're going to need some samples of shingles and siding. I think in the past we've just said that it will match the existing 
Okay. Society. And that is that a condition you want to see samples once they get a handle on it, or no? No, we, we haven't t we haven't really ever required that in the past for an addition. We've just stipulated in the approval that it would match. Okay. I mean, we, if you all want me to look at a sample, I'm happy to, of course. Um, no, we want it to match. Yeah, <laughs> my intent is um, definitely yeah. to get it to match. Other questions for the applicant? Okay, I'm going to open the floor for public comment. Seeing none, I'll close the floor for public comment. Um, other questions or discussion from commissioners? Should we uh, simply stipulate that the new shingles be uh, hand split rather than machine? There, um, there's, quite a, there's quite a difference in texture. Correct, yeah. there is. And there's the existing has about 20 layers of paint on there too. So we're not, <laughs> I want, I, my intent is to be as seamless as possible. Right. You know, I don't. If I could put 20 layers of paint on there to make it blend, <laughs> but, but you know, you know, it's really obvious. It's really obvious between now, like what you see right. now that's there, and and like I said, I've already been trying to get my hands on those. Unfortunately, most of the places that I've talked to that supply the hand split there are four roofing um there's nobody local that has that i've found that has hand split cedar shingles which are for the wall yeah, yeah. Uh, well and i think roof. what shingles makes it roof. yeah i learned that in this process too okay. it's like counter and i learned something too yeah i did too what makes it a little bit interesting i think is that normally our additions are offset from the corner so you have this sort of a break corner that you can transition make yeah. that transition more gracefully than just running it flat across well, the wall and but, i believe on the one side they run just a transition board what was the yeah. old corner board is there you know and if at all possible and it all planes out correctly then we might get rid of that and try to make it as seamless as possible um yeah my intent is to make you look like that yeah i think that's a bit of a challenge i i uh to your question um wonder about the specific the, you know, the specificness of our requirement uh around you know particular not well not this i don't know how to set it back when the bottom is already there is the problem that's not a real elegant detail because you get this weird sort of what do you do with that piece space. of wood like piece of house that doesn't have a roof on it um so that gets a little bit weird and, and i think moves us away from the sort of style of the house in the first place i'm sort of weird little roof there but um in terms of how specific should we get about the um, is it a, is it specific enough for us to say the shingle should match and then it's uh, then it's y'all's in y'all's court to do that and then we don't get specific about the technique on it um, I think from because, the distance and the rise and where this starts it's well beyond the street view yeah it's going to be more of a homeowner's uh, passion to match his own house so that it looks seamless as, as it can with current materials right. well and i think too you know with an exhaustive search and you found machined cut things that looked good then we've made a made a problem that we didn't mean to make with our specific being so specific. I and think, so, too, it's, you know, we're always to some degree trusting, as far as materials that we've physically yeah. seen that already exist, that, you know, can be made, that we're trusting that the applicant's going to do what this, the approval says that they're going to do. True. And so, unless it's a new material, um, we, we have that we have it approved we, before. We oftentimes yeah. will have, like, a spec or something in our file if it's, like, a fiber cement siding mm -hmm. so that we have the documented, the reveal and all of that. But, um, but for, for a wood shape, we haven't, you know, if it's just going to match what's there. If it were, like, an entirely new house, we'd require a sample. But. So I think I'm comfortable with the clarity that it's going to match, and then it becomes y'all you have some flexibility to either find something or make something that um, 
is the best representation of it matching. So is there any work being done to the, I guess it'd be the 1950s edition ground, like first floor exterior? There's nothing being done. Um, new Everything's ceiling up and new flooring, but besides that. You're just framing right on top. We're coming, yes. Yeah, the engineers Take the already roof checked. Off and come on top. Yeah, we're taking the roof it, yeah, they're down to a normal, so that room's going to have a normal eight and a half ish yeah. height to it. So to enable the uh, addition above it. And that matches the original house too, because on the original house, all the roof heights are right at eight and a half on all, it's a, it's a four square, so all four of the squares. And then the upper is nine on all the original four squares. So it would match. And two, we don't want to step up and down. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, I'm not as young as I used to be. I'm, I'm a trip hazard now. If, there, if there's not another concern, then I'll make the motion. Did you do public comment? I thought I did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. It was there was just an abundance of it. You missed all of it. <laughs> yeah. There was just so much of it. <laughs> all right. I have been known to forget, so that's good that you're checking. Madam Chair. Based upon the evidence presented to this commission, including Exhibit A, application and project description, three pages, Exhibit B, photos, plans and drawings, five pages, Exhibit C, window specifications, Exhibit D, 1951 Sanborn fire insurance map, uh, Exhibit true? E, yeah, was there one? I'm sorry. Yes, it's there. Okay. Exhibit E, revised window specifications, three pages, received May 4th, 2023, and the Commission's actual inspection and review of subject property by all members except I am moved that this Commission approve the Certificate of Appropriateness based on the following. One, that the application is to remove one existing brick chimney on rear-facing portion of the roof, construct 372 square foot second story addition on rear elevation, Addition will have cedar shake siding, painted wood trim, Sierra Pacific 6 over 1 wood SDL double hung windows, and asphalt shingle roofing matching existing. Gable end dormer with faux vent with custom wood four light window will extend from rear facing portion of roof. All work will be in accordance with attached and approved drawings and plans. All permits, variances, or approvals as required by law must be obtained before work may commence. Two. That the standards for additions found on pages 88 to 89 and chimneys and chimney caps on pages 58 to 59 of the Montford Historic District Design Review Standards adopted on April 14th, 2010 and amended December 9th, 2019 were used to evaluate this request. Three, this application does meet the design standards for the following reasons. A, chimney being removed is not a character defining feature of the building. B, new addition is cited as inconspicuously as possible on the rear elevation and will be constructed on top of an existing first floor addition. C. New addition is designed so to be compatible with the existing building in height, massing, roof form, and pitch. D. Windows on the new addition are similar to those on the original building in their proportions, spacing, and materials. E. Siding and details are compatible with the existing building in material, texture, color, and character. 4. That the action and improvements proposed in the application before us for a certificate of appropriateness are congruous with the special historic character of the Montford Historic District. A second? I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Based upon the foregoing findings and for the reasons set forth therein, I move that a certificate of appropriateness be issued. Is there a second? I second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. We will all let you down. <laughs> okay, we're moving to Abemaro Park. We're going to 60 Terrace Road. Ahead of that, I wanted to just disclose that the applicant is, we are on a board together at Albemarle Park, and I don't think it's going to affect, but if the applicant or anyone on the board thinks, on the commission thinks it will, I'll recuse myself. Hearing that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to start with Alex and Stephanie. Thank you. 
Um, okay, I'm going to start with some photos. This application is also pretty straightforward as well, though it does have a couple of different moving parts. So um, this application is for um, Fox Den, which is the little accessory structure to Fox Hall Cottage on Terrace Road. Um, it's an original accessory structure to the district. It's right up on the street. Hopefully you were able to make it by. Um, the proposal is to um, remove the two existing chimneys on the structure. They are, one is CMU and is pulling away from the structure and one is brick pulling away from the structure. The little bump out on the left hand side is actually um, an addition that was in the, I believe around 1951, something like that. So it's not original to the structure. Um, I did get some additional photos from um, Robin Rains, who is here to represent, representing the people representing the property owner. <laughs> <laughs> so they could not be here today. Um, so she has some additional photos of close-ups of the, of the chimney that I added to your folder a little earlier today, and we can pull them up and look at them if you all want to as we're talking. Um, but they're pretty in pretty bad shape structurally. Um, and we know that they're both not original to the structure um, since the, the brick one was constructed um, on the addition. Um, <clears throat> the other kind of major component of this application is there is a door on the side elevation. I always get directionally turned around in this neighborhood. I believe it's the south elevation um, where there's a door opening that they would like to um, take the door, remove the, or the existing door and widen the, the doorway and um, install a new door so it would be Right now, it's not actually centered under that little roof overhang. I know it's probably hard to see in my slide, but it's set over to the left-hand side underneath that overhang, so the new opening would be fully centered within, within the opening. And again, this is an existing addition, so, and it's on a side elevation. So um, I, the, I don't know that the design standards for Albemarle Park are not abundantly clear when it comes to changes to um, additions and that later kind of features. So um, I did not note any concerns, I think, because the opening is pretty much staying in the same place um, and it's really not going to change the character of this elevation at all. Um, <clears throat> the application also includes replacement of uh, an existing light fixture um, that's adjacent to the garage entry. So the one on top is the one that's um, they were proposing to replace, and then the one on the bottom is an image of an existing fixture on the structure that they would like to um, mimic the style of for the new fixture that will be installed next to the pedestrian door. And the other two things are the top left on the um, floor plan, they're showing, um, if you look at the, let me see, there's probably a better photo in the plans. But if you, at the top middle photo, there's a course of brickwork along one side of the little concrete pad that goes into the, um, the carriage house doors. And they want to match on the left-hand side of that paved area with a row of brick within the site. Um, and hopefully you all went by the site, most of the, the walkways and everything are all brick. So even though that's not necessarily a stand or, or material that's called out as being appropriate for paving in the district um, for driveways, it is the most common paving material to this particular property. Um, <clears throat> and then they're also proposing to remove a mature pine tree um, towards the rear of the lot and along Banbury, and that will be replaced. It's a white pine, and that's not, there's a planting list in the back of the um, landscape standards and there aren't really, there's um, maturing like hollies and that sort of evergreen, but not um, anything bigger like a spruce or anything like that. So they're proposing to replace it with a red maple, which is on the planting list. So that was, that's all the things. Any questions for me? I didn't see that brick when I looked. What, what's that part? The, so the side, the 
cutout that goes into the in the door entrance is going to be <coughs> paved with brick, or it's just a trim piece around the concrete? So it's basically just where it, how it comes out from the wall of the mm -hmm. beside the carriage house door. It'll just be a strip, Nick. just like that on the other okay. side. Okay. And the other brick that you were talking about that's on site is also an original brick, or is it like? I'm assuming so, but I don't know when that. Like, if you look at the front walkway up to the primary structure, it's all very much brick, brick cheek walls and everything. And so I am assuming that that, but I don't have a way of knowing whether that was um, completely original or whether it was replaced at some point. But I, since this is such a small detail and not like a paved patio or something large, I didn't really consider it to be out of character with the site or the district. And also on the, um, the wall where the door is getting moved over. Do you say that is not part of the existing, or part of the original? Right, wall? right. Yeah, there, it's a, it's an addition on the house that was built in the 50s. And I think I put the Sandbor map in the file. I did not add it to the slides, though. sworn in at the get-go? I wasn't. Okay, we'll do that real quick. To have some people sit in the back, I think they maybe came in after we did that. Got your chimney photos pulled up too in case we need those. Okay, if you'll raise your right hand, please. Um, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the information you present during the hearing for a certificate of appropriateness before the Historic Resources Commission shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Do you? Hi, um, I'm Robin Rains, and I am representing these people. I am not a part of the team, so I am here to answer your questions and um, <laughs> and help in any way that I can. Um, Sally is at her daughter's college graduation. Ah, so. that's important. <laughs> it is very. <laughs> um, so. What questions do you have? I mean, I think Alex explained everything. I don't have any more information <coughs> to add. I can show, I have pictures of the chimneys <coughs> in more detail if you want to see that, but. I mean, I would like to see that, I think. You would like to see that? Okay. I can get to it. Can get you to just it. told me where they were. Okay. The ones in our packet. Yeah, in our packet. Oh, yeah. Um, so it interrupts the fascia, you can see that. And you can see a little bit on the left side down below the crack, but um, let's see, there's, there's where the brick is pulling away from the stucco wall. And there's where it's, it's got a bracket at, top, at the top. Do you see the bracket? Can you see that? I think that's holding it on. Um, but the crack gets, gets wider as you go up. And there's the bottom of it and the footing is a little bit below that so it doesn't go all the way to the footing of the floor and they've had lots of water intrusion at this chimney detail so what they want to do is waterproof all along that grade there to keep water intrusion from happening and there's the footing and um, there's where they're going to waterproof I don't have pictures of the CMU chimney, but I felt like it wasn't, I mean, it's pulling away too, but it's obviously not original at all. Um, but, um. Any questions for Robin? Okay. I'm gonna open the floor for public comment. Don't all rush at once. Uh, close the floor for public comment. Um, any further discussion from commissioners? I'm prepared to make a motion. Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, based on the evidence presented to this commission, including Exhibit A, application and project description, seven pages, Exhibit B, photos, plans, and drawings, two pages, Exhibit C, site plan, Exhibit D, tree removal, site plan, Exhibit E, arborist report, five pages, Exhibit F, door specification, 
two pages, Exhibit G, Owner's Affidavit, Exhibit H, 1925 Sanborn Fire Insurance Map, Exhibit I, 1951 Sanborn Fire Insurance Map, Exhibit J, Additional Photos, six pages, received May 2nd, 2023, Exhibit K, Chimney Photos, six pages, received May 10th, 2023, and the Commission's actual inspection and review of subject property by all members. I move that this commission approve the certificate of appropriateness based on the following. That the application is for renovations to accessory structure, including removing of one, removal of one non-original CMU chimney and one non-original brick chimney. Soffits and fascia where chimneys are removed will be patched, repaired with materials matching existing widening of pedestrian entryway on the east elevation and replacement of existing door and aluminum storm door with new rogue valley nine light over wood panel door centered beneath roof overhang. All new trim will match existing in material, dimension, texture, and color. Remove one light fixture from the east elevation and install one new light fixture adjacent to entry on east elevation. Install new course of brick within landscape matching existing section of brickwork adjacent to garage entry. Remove one 29 inch uh, DBH white pine tree adjacent to southeastern property boundary. One red maple tree will be planted in the same location as tree being removed. All work will be in accordance with the attached and approved drawings and plans. All permits, variances, or approvals as required by law must be obtained before work may commence. Number two, that the standards for roof ventilation, flashing, and chimneys found on page 29, windows and doors on page 31 of the architectural standards, and lighting found on page 42, driveways and parking on page 30, and paths and walkways on page 31, and trees on page 22 of the landscape standards for the Albemarle Park Historic District adopted July 8, 2015, were used to evaluate this request. This application does meet the design standards for the following reasons. The chimneys are not original to the structure and are not structurally sound. Entryway and door being modified are on a non-original addition. New door will be wood and all trim will match existing. Existing light fixture being removed is not original. New fixture is congruous with the character of accessory structure and will have a uh, motion detector or timer to keep from burning continuously. Existing driveway paved area is edged with brick. A new section of brick is very minimal and will match the existing. That the, addition, uh, or that the action and improvements proposed in the application before us for a certificate of appropriateness are congruous with the special character of the Montford Historic District. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Based upon the foregoing findings and for the reasons set forth therein, I move that a certificate of appropriateness be issued for this project. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion also carries. Okay. We're going to break for a second. Yes, we just need a quick break to get them so, set up with their good samples. That sounds good. We will, we're going to take a quick break, and next up on our agenda will be in Biltmore Village um, at 1 Angle Street and 10 Kitchen Place. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were going to 
<laughs> you are just looking at the back of your head. We all start to look like No, not really, but just from the back of your head. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's great. And Adrian, uh, Bert, I've never actually heard her talk, but she is a pretty nice she was the one who spoke about like, equity and preservation. Um, at least I think she's from. Well, I'm 
Biltmore Village, and we're going to start with um, Alex's staff report. Thank you. Um, this is going to look like a fair amount of slides, but I'm going to try to keep it pretty short and sweet because I know that the, um, the applicant has quite a lot of information they'd like to get through with you in terms of their formal presentation. Um, so I, I'm mostly just including the basics here. So this is the site um, on the top left is the site map showing pretty much all of the village. This is um, kind of right kind of right in the heart of the village, if you will, along Hendersonville Road. Um, to the right is the proposed site plan. And I think what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of go through my slides really quickly, and then I'll come back to the elevations and just talk through my the concerns I've noted in my report. Um, this is the kitchen place elevation. As you can see, there's a uh, commercial style building on the right hand side, uh, a cottage style building in the middle, and then kind of more um, English manorial style um, on the left hand side. Um, this is the um, Angle Street elevation. And also on the bottom right is the, um, the cottage um, Elevation detail pulled out. Uh, Hendersonville Road. And this is Boston Way. So now I'm just going to take everyone through some slides, just kind of hopefully everyone made it to the district and wandered around. Um, but just to kind of drive around together and look at, look at the um, conditions of the district nearby to this site. Um, so this, the top image is looking south of Kitchen Place. The lower photo is looking at Boston Way and the McGahee Building um, on the corner to the north. Oops. Um, this is a direct shot head on of the, the commercial buildings that are along Kitchen Place on the opposite side of the street. And then the lower two images um, on the right is looking um, into the district from Hendersonville Road um, with the Cathedral of All Souls on your right hand side. And then um, the bottom left is looking at the site with the existing bank structure um, on the bottom left. And then this is looking the opposite direction, um, looking south on Hendersonville Road from a couple of different angles. Um, on the bottom left, you can see the, the entire site basically and, and then the, the image on the bottom right is again looking north on Hendersonville Road. Or sorry, yeah, that's north. Just, and I wanted to kind of catch the, a little bit of the Bohemia in that, in that corner too, so you could kind of see that for scale with the buildings across the street. Um, and then I also, this is the top photo. It's hard, kind of hard to see because the foliage is so grown in in front of this one cottage, but this is the, the corner of Boston Way and um, Angle Street, or Swan Street. And it is looking uh, west towards the site. So you're basically looking at the back of the commercial buildings with a cottage in the foreground at the corner. Um, and then the bottom right image is looking south on Boston Way, um, just to give a contextual photo of kind of where the um, original cottage area is still intact. All right, I'm going to go back. Um, so hopefully everyone had a chance to um, get their 
bearing straight on this project since it does have a lot of, a lot of um, moving parts for us to get through in our discussion. But the primary kind of concern that I've noted, um, I also wanted to let you know that I pulled out the relevant sections or the sections that I called out in my staff report within the design standards. Um, I extracted those pages so you don't have to scroll through the whole documents. Um, because there are a few places to look. Primarily for our new construction, we're looking at um, book one, which has site design, uh, building color, and lighting. And then book three, new construction, the standards for new construction and contemporary style. And then there's the development plan that also has pedestrian environment um, information as well as um, future land use sub areas and architectural areas. Um, and so those between those two things, I've noted in my, my first two bullet points that the kitchen place is identified as sub area three, which is historic downtown commercial, meaning that it's um, drawing on the smaller scale commercial architecture that's um, across the street and within that general area of the district. Um, it says that architectural language should draw from original commercial style buildings and building heights are two to two and a half stories um, and storefront type facades at sidewalk. And then um, the, if you look at that redevelopment map, it kind of splits the block um, vertically if you're looking at the map um, from north to south. Um, and so like the side that's on kitchen places within that sub area three and then the other side that's on the west side of the block is sub area two which is high density highway cottage um, which notes increased setbacks and building heights of two to three stories and then when you uh, go to book three it identifies 30 feet as the maximum building height for new construction and i know all of you are probably going to have questions for me about what else has been constructed in the district in recent years and the height of those of the buildings, um, particularly the Bohemian, which is the same developer. So we can get through that. I will just note that um, when that project was reviewed, we had a set of flexible development standards in our ordinance that we do not have anymore. Um, so we're a little more limited to what the standards are specifically saying. Um, if you look around at the district, you can see that the majority of building heights are probably around 30 feet, um, which you know is why that standard is written the way that it is. Um, I think, you know, just inserting a little bit of my professional or even personal opinion in here, you know, to, to build a commercial building at 30 feet, I think you're really gonna have to uh, do the math like we um, do it, at, it for looking at UDO calculation. So we would calculate the 30 feet to be the um, the ceiling height of the highest finished floor. So if you're thinking about it from a form perspective and where those overlap, you could, you know, theoretically put some more floor in the roof structure itself. Um, however, this building is exceeding 50 feet in some places. And so I have noted concerns about building height um, being my primary concern, I think that if we're breaking it down into individual kind of building expressions, so there's building one, which is that more commercial style building that's um, on the right hand side, and then the cottage type structure, the commercial type structures on that um, block are, are very diminutive as far as commercial structures go. And I feel like this is um, a little bit out of scale with that um, character. And I also, the cottage structure is, um, I, may, I took notes somewhere with all the building heights parsed out, but um, I think I marked them up in the elevations that are the CAD drawings that are in your folder. But um, uh, that, that it's really tall for a cottage type structure would probably more, you know, in, in the realm of like a typical height of a house, um, whereas that it's, I think it's exceeding 45 feet. Um, so it's pretty tall um, for that particular style. Um, I've also noted that the, the standards dictate that building facades that are wider than what is traditionally found in the district should have varying setbacks and materials. Um, and that I pulled into the discussion because of the, um, the elevation along Hendersonville Road primarily. Um, 
I think while it's certainly aesthetically a nice design, there's not very much pedestrian activation on this elevation, and so there's there's not a, a lot of opportunity for breaking up the facade into um, into kind of more um, cottage level or district level um, facades that you would typically see in this neighborhood. And I know that obviously we're talking about Hendersonville Road and it's this busy commercial corridor, but you have to you know, remember that the district goes all the way across to the other side of McDowell. And so if we're thinking about it in our future minds when none of us are here, we're hoping that the district, you know, over time reclaims itself even in that part that's more, um, you know, the, the, the busier um, corridors of McDowell and, and Biltmore. So I do think that there should be more um, of activation on this side that is, you know, pedestrian oriented. Um, the interior, if you look at the floor pans, it makes sense why it's not. There's a ballroom and a lot of back of the house and things like that. But I think um, maybe there's some work still to be done to help this elevation um, be a little more user friendly, if you will. Also, the, um, there's a connector between the little building three on the right and then building four on the left that's pretty contemporary. Um, and so I think that could be. Um, more historically appropriate, but that's just a kind of a minor thing since it's just a little connector um, in the overall scope of things that we need to talk through. Um, the standards also say major enter entrances should be defined with porches. Um, window frames, sashes, and muttons should be similar in scale to the original designs. Um, roofing is required to be muted red in color, which a couple of the buildings have, but I think there was a different, um, like there's a faux slate that maybe has a different color that's proposed. Um, and then I just noted some design details that are not necessarily typical of the district or the, and or their, the architectural styles they're shown on in the drawings. So the pergola structure is the first thing I would know. I, I know that they're drawing on details of the district for all of these to inspire all of these different features that have been designed the way that they are. I can't think of a pergola type structure in the district and also I think this one it's really tall um, so it's going to be very highly visible um, and so that's the first thing and then I noted that building one entryway ocular window and upper story design um, the pillared stone commercial storefront and fan light window and shake siding on um, building two and then the Juliet balconies, copper roofing, window shutters, and board and batten siding were the other features that I noted. And the architect and I have been um, conferring on just kind of fine tuning some of the last remaining things that um, we needed to get for review. So we do have the specs in there for the, um, the garage and loading dock doors. Um, there's some information in your packet or details in your packet for the um, awnings and shutters and uh, let's see what else um, I did talk with also the um, the site designer we just need to get clarification on the paving materials for the interior courtyard um, I think it's from what I understand obviously if you went to the site there are existing brick sidewalks on the three interior sides, the Hendersonville Road side is concrete, but there is brick and granite curbing that's existing. So I noted that they should reuse as much um, of that existing material as possible. And we do need to see a um, brick sample that will match what's there. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we need to be clear on are the street trees. There's a planting plan for this district. Um, the Angle Street and Boston Way um, planting strips are shown to have um, sycamore trees and then um, Kitchen Place has linden trees shown on the original plan. And so I, when I talked to um, Stephen Lee, the landscape architect, he was going to verify the tree placement and species. And there are some existing, I believe, he thought they might be sweet gum trees along Kitchen Place and asked if we would support removal if they were going to restore to the linden trees, and I said I thought that the commission would probably support that if they're, you know, trying to restore the original planting plan along that section. Um, and I believe there's a couple of linden trees 
or at least one other linden tree that will be on Angle Street that's, that's a new tree to go back towards the original planting plan as well. I think that was everything that I had to share from my list for now. Alex? Yes, Madam Chair. Alex, do we have a list of contributing and non-contributing resources in Biltmore Village? I know that it is not a National Register listed historic district, which is where we usually derive our contributing and non-contributing resources from. But since Biltmore Village is not a National Register listed district, does the local designation have an inventory of contributing and non-contributing resources? We don't, it's really just the boundary that we have. And then I did drop the, um, the multi-resource nomination in your application packet. So that's there, that really identifies what were the original historic buildings in the district. Um, that's not an exhaustive list, obviously, of all the buildings in the district. So if it's helpful to provide that to you all next time, we can try to try to finagle that and I can double check in our file to make sure we don't have an inventory that I haven't seen before. But. Yeah, if there was say an inventory when the ordinance was passed designating the Biltmore Village Local District and the reason I am asking is to ascertain the status of the commercial buildings across Kitchen Place to determine if those for the purpose of the local district are considered contributing and, and character defining in the district? That's a good question. And I know um, there are some folks here who are very well versed in more village history, so maybe Robert Griffin, whenever he wants to give public comment, or maybe he can speak to that. Um, I imagine that because the, de the development plan envisioned incorporating that style of architecture in new construction, that, they, that that was a point of reference as far as contributing structures. But I'll check our file and see if we have a formal inventory that lays that out specifically for the local designation. Thank you. Alex, I have a question. Um, the land use sub areas, um, on the plan I was referencing, it looks like the site is bisected and it's halfway in um, land use sub area one and half in land use sub area but I think you were re referencing two and three. Oh, what's that right? So, so I just wanted to uh, get a clarification on that. Um, I mean, hopefully I'm referencing the right site plan. That, yes, that's the correct site. Okay. So let me, let me go, let me check when I can sit down and look at the standards. I'll make sure that I update my staff report with the right info for that bullet point two in my staff report. Thank you for letting me know that. Other questions for Alex? Are you having issues with your? Yes. I think it's because that we've got so much yeah, it's internet activity happening in really here. Nothing. that. yeah. And it's really been filed, but it's, I can't. I mean, I, yeah. We, apparently, we've been struggling and technology-wise in here the last several public meetings, not just ours, so. Um, if you all don't have any more questions for me, I'll let the architect get his, he's got his own um, presentation to get set up. This is good right here. <laughs> I'll just not touch it for a minute and see if I can get Did you, how did you have this set up before? Move it over to here. I don't. I don't want to mess up that one. So that way I can. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Okay. <laughs> good. Good afternoon. My name is Christian Sotil. Um, I'm an architect, a preservationist, a planner. Um, we. Um, I practice in Savannah. Uh, and uh, we're fortunate to do a lot of our work in National Register Historic Districts. Um, I'm also an academic uh, with the Savannah College of Art and Design, um, where we have programs on historic preservation and arch 
architectural history, of course, architecture uh, and urban design. Um, so it, it goes without saying I'm very excited to be here in Asheville and to have the opportunity to work uh, in the historic Biltmore Village. I mean, it's it's a, it's sort of like a dream come true, um, and and so um, I'm. I'm I'll leave it at that. I'm excited to share what we have learned and what we've um, what we have come to over the of two years of planning. Um, but to introduce the team that we have here with us today, Mark Kessler is here, uh, and Nick Schumacher with the Kessler Collection, who are certainly already neighbors here in Asheville in the Biltmore Village. Um, Matthew Lehman with the Grand Bohemian, um, and then on our professional team, Stephen Lee with SiteWorks and Jonathan Cook with Raven Architects, who's partnered with us on this project. So we have a, a great team here. I was gonna actually introduce Robert Griffin as maybe part of our team, um, but he's a contributing resource uh, <laughs> within the district, for sure. Um, and, but but I, I do wanna say that we have been working for um, almost two years on this design, and um, we've, we've had many opportunities to share and discuss with resources like Robert Griffin, um, um, Martha Fullington, and Mike McLaughlin with the cathedral, and uh, Reverend Sarah Holbert, and I appreciate them all being here today. Um, and numerous meetings. Um, ben Mitchell, also with the Biltmore Village Property Association, um, sent a, a letter um, of support for the project. So we appreciate that, and we appreciate the continued input. We're very excited to actually be here with you all this afternoon after this long path that we've been down, knowing that this is such a significant project. And so we're, we're excited to be here. Um, what I wanted to do is give you an, an overview of our analysis and our design process to walk, walk you through the thinking here, knowing that we have lots to talk about. Um, so let me see if this is working. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, then, yeah, let me get started. Um, and what I'll do too, as I go through this, I'd like I can speak to some of the comments that, um, that Alex and I have been talking about, and some of the comments that are in the staff reports. I'll try to fold all that together. Um, but it, it really, of course, it really begins with sort of putting Biltmore Village on the map as one of the maybe one of the most unique places in America, as the satellite outside of the city of Asheville, but a place really with its entirely its own invented context. Um, and so it represents, you know, over a century of American development patterns, but it begins with this very strong intent, um, certainly well known around around the country. Um, and then you bring together Richard Lawrence Hunt and Frederick Law Olmsted and Richard Sharp Smith, and you've, you have um, truly uh, a magical situation with the, the plan of the village, the clear structure of that plan, um, and the intent of that plan going back to the consecration of All Souls in 1896. Um, so as we've, we've studied that, this is sort of like a place that you wonder if you, you know, you'd like to visit, but to have a chance to get to know it better, certainly understanding and, and sort of walking the footsteps of, of Hunt and, and the cathedral. But then we also have a, a place that has evolved through the ravages of the 20th century, and certainly the automobile era, and, and, and the commercialization of Hendersonville Road is a very real part of the history. And talking with Robert, going back to the 1992 plan, you've seen, you know, just seeing photos of how much progress has been made since that time. But you sort of have a village that's sort of one side is intact and the other side, it's like a schizophrenic in a sense. It has one side that, um, when you, if you divide it in the center, the, that beautiful route down Kitchen Place between the cathedral and the depot, um, and that sort of that fan shape of Kitchen Place, you have you know, a portion of the village which is very, very much intact and then a portion that has really been um, sort of was given over to the automobile. So we, we really began this project with this thought about restorative architecture, restorative urbanism, in a sense that here we are 125 years later making decisions in our time that will be that will build on the history of this place. That's the opportunity. And when we, we think about, too, this particular site is really sort of like two lungs in the village. It's, it's, it's the other, it's the left lung, and it's remarkable because it is very much a parking lot today uh, with you know, drive-throughs. So it's still sort of carrying the hangover of the 20th century. 
in. Um, so of course, and we showed some photos of the site already. I can key on key in maybe just on a few things. Maybe certainly first and foremost, the cathedral is not just a local landmark, but a national landmark. Um, whether or not it's on the national register of or the districts listed or not. Um, and, and all the many details that make the village so unique. On our site, one, one particular feature that we drew um, you know, inspiration from early on was a, a landmark oriental spruce tree that's at the corner of Angle and Kitchen Place. So you can see that there. And then these images at the bottom show kind of the, the strip of uh, Hendersonville as we look, look, look across to the site. In the core of the village, you can see you know, the, the path to the depot, which is certainly you know, part of this visual axis. Um, and then you know, the path to the, to the cathedral here. And as we look up Boston Way, we can see, actually we're looking on to the Grand Bohemian here in the background. Looking across Hendersonville, we can see the parking and service area behind the New Morning Gallery. Um, and then we can see those commercial um, shop front structures that really define that early 20th century pattern of building that took place in the village um, after the, the Hunt and Smith era, which is of course talked about in the plan as part of that story. Um, and so taking a good close look at those buildings too, really finely detailed um, structures. The McGehee building in particular has really just spectacular detailing in the brickwork. Um, so we, we came to the site thinking of it really as a, as a mixed use project and really as a kind of an urban design project as much as it was an architectural one. And so as we looked at that whole block and we realized the frontages were too different. The, the 1992 plan calls for two buildings with a parking deck. Now, and I've talked to Robert about this. This was the 90s. This was sort of a way of laying out what should be happening there. Um, and that would be good, you know, a frontage on Kitchen and a frontage on Hendersonville. Um, what we, so, and that is good. Um, we felt like there's more to do here. There's more to, to, to really make this a campus of buildings. We would be best suited by, by creating expressions that best relate to each frontage condition. So we created four, sort of four friends in this block um, as, as an ideal, as a vision for it. And we, and we sort of gave them identities. So number one is we're calling our friendly corner. This is the corner that's diagonally across from, or really next door you might say, to the McGehee building that looks out to Biltmore Plaza. As we move up the street, up, up, up Kitchen Place. The second building we refer to as the Jewel Box. This a smaller structure, thinner frontage on the street, something with definable geometries that were unique um, that helped to build out the streetscape along Kitchen. Then, you know, the, the question of what do you build near All Souls Cathedral? Like, this is a, a terrifying question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And so what we, we refer to this as a building that needed to really salute all souls and really be, and, and we've had a lot of rich dialogue with the cathedral about the best ways to do that. This building has actually been through a lot of changes to what you're gonna see uh, tonight. Um, but that, that question of that building, its number one job is to be a good neighbor to, to the cathedral. Um, and then building four, we referred to as kind of an anchoring building. It was a place where more massing was more appropriate. We called it sort of anchoring Hendersonville. And it's the existing Grand Bohemian uh, Hotel is here, which is really a single expression. It's sort of one big building. Um, we wanted to take a different approach here and, and think of this as a campus of smaller individual expressions. But we felt like number four probably relates most definitely to the Grand Bohemian that's there because they are kind of kitty corner to each other. And the job we have here is to kind of armor the village from the highway in a sense so, so that you're not, you, you can have you know, a safe walkable space on Kitchen Place. So from an urban planning point of view, I think each of these has an expression and each of these has a responsibility in the design. So those four ideas are really what will follow through everything in, in the thought process that we've, we've had. You can see in the round level plan of the building, our friendly corner is actually a restaurant use 
that will have an upper level lounge that overlooks Biltmore Plaza. Um, we have our, our passenger drop off with a porch structure um, in the center, kind of making the block porous along Kitchen Place. Our jewel box is a gallery, so we wanted a commercial space really to try to activate as many of our frontages, certainly the important frontages on Kitchen Place. Um, then our, our All Souls uh, salute, um, we actually have as a quieter use so that it doesn't spill out onto the churchyard and keeps that frontage quiet. So that's a little more of an inward function to the building. It's, it's where the spa would be located. And then the anchoring building, this, is, this building is the one that has kind of the hard work of making everything work. Um, the Hendersonville piece, number four, um, that has the ballroom, it has back of house, and it actually has the um, access to the parking, which is subgrade, which was another um, planning decision that we made early on that putting a parking garage on the block just seemed this block is too important that that, that should not be done and so we we've, we've in our plans indicated that all of the parking for the project um, would be out of sight and so there would be an entry and exit point of course but Boston is really the best street to do that across from the new morning galleries garage so there has to be a place where that can happen. So that's kind of an overview of how the building, um, the plan works as we move to the upper floors. Each of those um, identities carries up into the upper architecture. And, um, and, and so what we do is we have a, a structure that is um, built with um, roof expressions similar to the existing Grand Bohemian Hotel or multiple floors or you might say half stories are bundled into the roof um, again to manage scale I think that's the number one thing in the Biltmore Village is one of the best ways to visually manage scale and to, to relate in our own time to a place with this with, with such a heritage um, so we've done that we in, in conversation and you'll we'll show you in, in, in a moment we've we really focused our our buildings that would reach up into the roof form the highest on Hendersonville and on Boston. And in fact, in the course of the design process, actually removed a floor from building three and building two with specifically in, in respect to working to, to decline the massing toward the cathedral. So you, we have roof plans at this level um, there. Um, how to find the language for this architecture? This is interesting because there's so much good precedent here. And um, so it's always a challenge. So, you know, it's not a copycat of something, but it's inspired by what's here. So a lot of time has been spent walking the village and sketching and drawing the details and really sort of putting our hands through some of those same um, steps that, that Hunt and, and Smith um, laid out and other architects up into the you know, 1920s and 30s with such elegant buildings. So drawing on form languages and motifs that would be, we felt at home here um, and, and in a sense making the village more complete, um, not just mirroring. It's too big of a site to just mirror things that are already exactly, you know, done in exact, exactly the same way. So trying to find that, that that point between creative invention and, and, and really a deep respect for the quality of the village. So, so we, used, we used those early studies to start to arrive at, at a language, which is now, you can see in the details. Um, but to, to talk about the form and the massing just a bit, um, this is a, a view of that stepped massing that we arrived at over many months um, working you know, with the team and working with the, the community. And you can see here, we're looking along Hendersonville. So All Souls is in the background. In this view, we're, we're, we're heading south. And you can see this is building four here and then building three here. And, and what we've done is we've, we've lowered that building by a floor in our design process so that there would be a, a kind of a stepped down scale as you open up toward the cathedral. And I want to point out too that we use the upper, the gables of the, um, the cathedral as kind of a benchmark. The, there's a, that array of lower gables and we've sort of ensured that the buildings adjacent would be um, below that. And so we felt like this was a successful strategy. This is approaching um, along Hendersonville now, we're heading north. So we're heading 
in that direction, and you can see the cathedral and the, uh, the, the structures beyond. So this is what we're calling Building 3, which is the saluting building, and then Building 4 in the background, the anchoring building, which, which has, has a, one additional level to it. And then turning around onto Kitchen Place now, looking back toward the cathedral, this shows the streetscape with Building 1, our, our friendly corner, um, building two, which is the jewel box, and then our, our porch, in a sense, our trellis that's part of that passenger area that helps to keep continuity in the streetscape, but keeps it permeable as well. So that's that facade along Kitchen Place, um, made up of multiple pieces, and, and I, I, think that's, I think that's what we're most excited about, is that this is a, a it's an, urban, it's an urban restoration strategy, and it's a mixed-use infill strategy between galleries and restaurants, and certainly there's a hospitality use that anchors it. Um, but we have Building 1, which is a masonry structure in, in relationship to its neighbors on, in both directions. We have Building 2, the jewel box, which has a gambler roof. Um, and, and a shingle facade. It does have cut stone at the base. There are good examples of cut stone in, um, in, you know, nearby across the street. And then here you're looking at an, ang at, <clears throat> at an angle onto Angle Street to um, Building 3. And the Oriental Spruce, I mentioned it in the beginning, that formed a, uh, an opportunity for a courtyard at the corner. We felt like that was a really important element because it's so tall that it also kind of puts everything in context for us. Um, this is coming back around <clears throat> onto Angle Street, so this is our, that, that structure that would face most directly to the cathedral. And, and a lot of the, the form language and sort of this dialogue of vertical and horizontal proportions is really inspired by the, the parish hall of the, of the cathedral itself and, and down to materials and colors as well so that there's sort of a visual, a visual resonance, you might say, of, of, with that piece. And I think that's something we sort of came to in the process. If I could show you the original design, it was very different. Um, but I want to thank um, Robert Griffin in particular for really kind of help, continuing to help us kind of think through the best ways to, to work with that element. This is coming back around on Boston Way. Um, so here we're looking at that friendly corner. It does have a chamfer to it, just as the McGehee building does. And then you can see our anchoring building. We, we actually used the same, the same approach that the Grand Bohemian did um, years ago in terms of its vertical surface ending and then moving into a roof form strategy. That one does it with a hip roof. We did it with a gable roof to try to create some differentiation between them. Um, but that's really what we were, what we were searching for was a, a way for this building to kind of be the workhorse for the project because it's a, it's a location that's best suited for that, but to not do a, a copycat of the existing building that's already there. So we took a gable versus a hip approach with that. You can actually, yeah, this, now here you are on, on Hendersonville, you can see that. So that's building four, which has this collection of, of gables that create kind of a geometry, maybe hearkening back a bit to the mountain ranges around, um, this, around the region. And then we kind of move into this more reductive uh, building and more, more in concert with the form language and the material language of the cathedral. So, so those are the concept renderings. There, we do a lot. We feel like the best way to design is by hand, and so we've a lot of what you've seen here has has been lovingly drawn. Um, so we took those elevations and we we took each identity and created the reference details uh, for that for your review. Um, and so that's what these elevations show are kind of the, the cutaways that we'll, we'll we can look at in more detail. So we go around the building. We have the elevations here again in total, just at a slightly larger size. And then, um, and then we move into um, the, the enlargements of the elevations. This is a building that we're seeing as a polychromed brick. Um, it actually has evolved a bit. It, we began thinking of it as a painted brick building. Um, but what we are proposing, and we actually have some brick samples here, samples of everything here actually, um, to show you know, a, a color range that allows us to do some unique detailing with that building. We do have this very gracious, inviting arch at the entrance. That is absolutely a, a design 
decision. It's a, it's a way, it, we want this to be our friendly corner and an arch is sort of this beautiful, it's a geometry certainly reminiscent of Hunt's era and the Richardsonian and you know all, all of the, the sort of this, this beautiful bold brickwork that was happening at that time. And we felt like this was a great way to, this is a way to be a bit different than the next door neighbor, but also to sort of draw people into the corner. So, um, so, so that's a reason for it. Um, certainly there's evidence of arches throughout um, in other locations in the village, but that was our thought process there. Um, you can see as we move along the side of the building, a lot of, um, sort of effort put into developing polychromed details to sort of bring that scale, decline that scale. Um, in horizontals introduced throughout, we do have a system of awnings at actually at 30 feet uh, that move their way around the building. I, I do want to talk um, as, as we get into some of these about the question of height and section, but I'm going to wait for the sections to talk about that in more detail. Um, this is the jewel box facing, uh, facing kitchen place, which has a cut stone base and, uh, and then shingles above. And then our timber trellis. And I, I will say this is, you might think of it as the porch, if this is the entry, the passenger area for, you know, for, for coming in and out of, of the hospitality use. This is the front porch, as the ordinance calls for. Um, but its details are 100% inspired by the rail depot, by the robust detailing, the brackets, the beautiful chamfering. Um, the chamfering in Billmore Village is incomparable. So we felt like this is something to be loved and to be developed as something really um, beautiful and, and robust in its details. So we're indicating that with the design drawings here. Um, there's some softening lines to it. It lands on, on good sturdy brick bases, but then it kind of turns into this beautiful structure. And in fact, the railing is directly um, measured from original Biltmore Village railing. So those kinds of little details have been, we think, very enriching to learn about. They are unique to the Biltmore Village. So we want this to have that DNA, but also be something that's not here yet, because this is a big block. It's an important block. Um, this is our, our structure that's next to All Souls. Um, and you just get a sample here of the, of the design. We have an elevated brick base to that with a battered wall, maybe a bit from the sales office, Hunt's design for the sales office. Then we move into the, the half timbering for the body of the building. And then we move into the roof form uh, above that. And the upper stories are both bundled into that roof level. So again, manage, trying to manage scale intelligently throughout uh, the, pro the project. And some close-ups on the details. We really couldn't help but start to really develop additional detail here because of the, the inspiration uh, for it. Um, the Hendersonville building, again, this is very much modeled on the existing Grand Bohemian, which has uh, you know, a vertical wall surfaces and then it moves into its roof form. We did, to, to create variety, we looked at doing this with gables rather than hip roofs. Um, to bring together some geometries that we thought would not just look good in elevation, but actually would look good um, from the passenger's view because there's such a high volume of folks traveling up and down Hendersonville. So, so the sections, this is um, kind of a cutaway for each of those building elements. And I want to talk about that because there are some you know, questions, certainly Alex and I have been talking about the height um, and, and the way the ordinance is structured. And of course, the Grand Bohemian that's there. Um, so um, one, one point I, I want to introduce for discussion is that the, the 30 foot rule that's noted in the ordinance, make sure I'm looking at this right. Um, it, it describes that it's for, yeah, so it's in book four. Yeah, book four. Um, it describes that new buildings, uh, primary, facade, primary facades should not exceed 30 feet in height. Primary fa facades. It doesn't say building height. It's not a maximum building height. It says primary facades, which before the staff report, I was sort of confused because we had always interpreted that as the vertical surface, meaning you know this part of the facade. And so we you know, had certainly you know, kept that in mind as we designed uh, for that because, the, the, um, because we knew the rule. 
um, and, and we also interpreted as well that the existing Bohemian followed that same rule. The fact of the um, the fact of the heights that are proposed in the in the design are uh, for building two, that vertical wall would be 17 feet. For building three, it would be 20 feet six inches, and for building four, it would be uh, 22 six. So all, all below the 30. Um, and then the roof form begins uh, at that point. So that, that's really how we were we were thinking about it. And in the case of in the case of um, building four on, on Hendersonville, we we modeled it exactly on the, the heights of the existing Grand Bohemian because that is knowable. It, it's um, that case. Its vertical wall is 27 feet, and then its roof form is 22 feet. So its total height is. 49 feet and that's that was our, our rule of thumb because we assumed that would be a good rule of thumb because it's there and it's you know it's knowable um, and then with the so so that's sort of the the probably that that's the workhorse building that's the anchoring building number four building three as we've mentioned has been brought down by a floor and building two is really very heavily focused on that gambrel roof um, so it has the lowest vertical surface um, before that roof begins um, building one, building uh, one is is a building that we sort of consciously let that extra floor be visible, recognizing it would be a story taller than its neighbor. And we often find in historic districts, new construction being a story taller is not a bad thing. It shows the you know we're at a different time in history. Um, but in respect to the thirty foot rule, we we in, have have placed awnings continuously around that facade. We've sort of divided that facade with awnings and balconies so that it can present itself as a contemporary structure in the context of a historic uh, district, uh, but, but also one that is sort of very aware of the need to kind of define horizontal breaks. And so that was our way of doing that. So we want, I wanted to share that with you. Um, so, so with that, um, with that, we can sort of bring it back to the overall context. And here now we can see that elevation along Kitchen Place with the multiple facades. You actually you know, can see one, two, three, four, four different expressions in that area. Um, but if we go to those, the, the lower gable of the, uh, of the church, you can see the idea here is that the saluting building is in fact lower uh, than, than the, the lower gable of the church. Not, of course, not to mention the tower above. And we felt like that was good. We felt like that was a good way to approach it, recognizing that the building massing at the other corner would be a bit taller. And um, here again, in the other direction, you can see that building sort of below and then going back and matching the Grand Bohemian with the Hendersonville building. Um, we do have specifications for colors and materials and finishes. We wanted to be as prepared as we could be before coming to talk with you all. So we have all that in your packet. I could answer any questions. We did develop a color palette for each building. And working with Alex, we're able to, we started with Farrow and Ball colors because we felt like that was British and that would go well in an English village. Uh, but we've converted those to um, Benjamin Moore and other colors that are part of the approved Biltmore Village color palette. So those, and we have examples of the selections that are here. Um, again, one for each building, building two in this case. Um, we are proposing, I, I want to talk about color for a moment. We are proposing uh, slate shingles on some of these buildings, again, in an effort to vary um, the, the, the all souls, the saluting all souls would be the little we see barrel tile roof in a fire flash red. We didn't have the exact color, but I brought kind of a range of colors that we were able to get access to. But I think the goal here is actually to be very congruent with the cathedral's roofing. So we'll want to make sure we get that just right. Um, but we felt like it would be responsive to the concept to vary colors for each element that has a you know, visible roof. And so we have proposed colors that are definitely in the dark range that bring some reds in and some plums that are natural slate colors. Um, but we want to get your thoughts about that uh, as well. So 
that's a lot to go through. I appreciate y'all listening. Um, I have provided some extra details, as Alex mentioned um, in the staff report. She had um, requested some additional detail on the awning, so I have that here. Um, we see these being really beautiful um, decorative elements. I think all of all of this has to be. Um, so the awnings are very much a part of the commercial uh, core of the of the village, and so we, we, we see ourselves doing that. I also have the material for the awnings here next. The cast, which is a dark umbrella fabric. The garage doors, the shutters, certainly beautiful precedents in the village for shutters. Um, board and batten detailing, just in, you know, kind of thinking through some of these, we are showing some board and batten detail and starting to explore how to refine that and bead the battens to, to, to break down the scale. So um, I think I probably should stop talking so I could take questions. You, I, I appreciate you all letting me share the, 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 the journey that we've been down. Um, we are certainly you know, here, happy to hear, hear any, any thoughts or questions that, that you have, and I hope I've addressed uh, some of the comments uh, as I've gone along here. So thank you. Madam Chair, I have a question. Um, could you go over your uh, formula for the height of the primary facades again, please? Oh, I'm sorry, was a question for me? Yes. I'm so I was sorry. Just a I thought that was for a than, than, <laughs> than a, a statement. Could you, could you please kind of re, re review, if you would, your formula for yes. coming to the conclusion that those heights were under 30 feet? So, the, well, the, the, 30, the, the text of the standard says that primary facades should not exceed 30 feet in height. So I would read that as an external facade. It's, it's in other jurisdictions, we typically look at the external expression, not the actual floors that may be happening behind, but it's what, what does it express as? And so reading that as a vertical surface, knowing that we are beginning um, the roof form above that. So using that, using that um, approach, let me, get back to the sections here. And, and specifically, I'm, I'm interested in how you apply that to the building you refer to as the jewel box. Well, I, th I think you, you, you have to acknowledge that that is in plane. And, and so you could read that primary facade from the ground to the, to the peak. I do, I do understand that. We applied the rule sectionally to where we, believe, where we sprang the roof. But you, you know, on a gable, you can come around to the gable end and certainly measure it. There may be a way of you know, creating an offset or a horizontal shelf that would be a way to think about that. I don't, we haven't done that yet. Because though. on the primary elevation, correct me if I'm wrong, the primary elevation is the gambrel end of that building. And so that elevation plane rises from grade to, to the ridge peak. line. Yes. And similarly, the gables on Hendersonville Road. Correct. Yeah, I would add same. that I think that your section through the Hendersonville Road portion is misleading because you've infilled in between the gables with those. If, if you look at your Hendersonville Road elevation, that's all infilled with windows, but your section shows that roof going back, and it doesn't actually do that in, in real life. It, it does. It, it does at, sure. at, the, at, the, at the primary corner. It does. So one it's, tiny corner. Yeah. On that yeah. Building. It does yeah. That. Yeah. I just, I just think that's a kind of a misleading section, though. If you could show, can you draw where the where the, yeah, the yeah. happens? Yeah. And and I guess just back, to, or is to, it playing with the exterior wall? To, to um, yeah. Let me come to that in just a second. To, I, could, I wanted to pull up building two quickly. That you know, I, I think. I guess if you would say applying a formula that where, where does the roof form begin in the gamble roof, even on a 
head-on view, we, we have a, you know, a deep bed mold and we have a flare, so we've created a, a horizontal break that defines where the roof begins. Um, I think just to, to say following the formula, you might say that, and I think we, we did think about that similarly along Hendersonville, that we've developed a pattern of piers here with the idea of creating sort of a deep recess so that there was a clear sort of division there. Um, but, but we are counting our roof spring uh, from this point. And you're, you know, uh, you, the, the, the primary view that people will have of this building is this corner. And so we did, you know, allow both gables to lay all the way back to create that sectional condition. So, and as we studied it three-dimensionally, we felt like that was successful. So are you saying in this illustration that the height ends at the roof spring? The, the wall height in our section that I think it's 22 and a half feet is to the roof spring. And what is the height to the peak of the gable? So it would be, I think we're 49 feet. Okay. We're 49 feet to the, to the peak. If I'm not mistaken, we were following the formula of the Grand Bohemian um, across the street with that. Okay. Yeah, the Grand Bohemian is 27 and 22, and we're sort of upside down, I guess, 20, 22 and 27, but, but, but the thought was following the same, the same protocol. And actually, you know, I have some photographs of that building if it, I, I thought it might, might be helpful. Christian, it looks like on the section you're showing it at 22 and a half and 29 and a half. So 51, 52. Is that true? Like, is that what you're showing on your section drawing? You're showing what you're saying, the, the highest point that you can. You know, that may include, I'm actually going to ask John, that may include a parapet. Okay. So the, certainly, so yeah, I think that that's what we're seeing there, which would add some additional height to, to sc provide screening and catch the, the roof form. I, in terms of the, where the building ends, we were following that 49, but that peak because of the parapet, then I guess we'll reach up to. Um, Which the parapet would also be able to cloud any HVAC. 50, yeah, 52. But I guess, does that dimension match from grade to the peak of the gable ends that are facing Hendersonville Road? Is that dimension the same? Uh, I'm you know, it, sure that's a good question. I, that's a good question. I don't know that it would, I think that would be a detail to, to resolve in the drawings, because I don't know that it would need to. I mean, so our intent was to really use this as our blueprint, but try to develop a, an alternative strategy so that they didn't look sort of like twins. Um, but but that, was, that was the idea. That may need to be resolved, studied further and resolved definitively. Um, yeah, this this is the the Grand Bohemian as as uh, that that's there, and and of course there are moments where you know it, it reaches, um, all the way you know up to the to some gable forms that it, it has, um, and you know in cases like that, um, but there's also I think one of the lessons taken here too was that there's a strong horizontal division between the upper architecture. And we felt like that, that was a, an idea to carry into the new building so that it would kind of create some, some symmetry as you move down Hendersonville. So when you're building, will, there also, will it also have that same sort of step, step back on the main level? Yeah, those piers are meant to kind of push the facade back so you get that shelf feeling there. Yeah. Can you go back to the section and draw on building four? That the section that includes that area in between. There we go. So in behind the gable, where the gable rises, this wall does sit within the gable. If that's yeah, yeah. And how high does that? 
so I think what we're, there's, there's a little bit of um, a study that needs to happen in the numbers. There's a parapet shown here, and I think the, the, the intent is that this goes to 49 feet. I think what we've done in this section is we bundled the parapet in, but what you see in the drawings ends at 49 feet. And that's um, the, I think you said that's the, that 49 feet is the same height as the grade one. Exactly, yeah. Our thought was we would start this project saying, we're not going to exceed that. That was decided, that was there, and it's and it's knowable, so it seemed like for for the anchoring building, the neighboring building, that was the, the, the best kind of way to approach it. And then on building one in section, your argument there is because you stuck an awning on it, that that underside of the awning to the ground is the 30 foot yes. primary facade. That is, that, that is what, that Can is. You show that again in elevation. Yeah, sure. So in, in elevation, we, we actually we, we have a, a balcony line as well above the first level, and then we have an awning line at the second level. So the thought process was to, to striate the building horizontally um, as a way of developing its, its kind of relationship. But particularly to the 30-foot rule, that strong band that you see on the facade is defined at that height. For, for that very reason, it's a definitive break in the facade. Alex, I have a question for you. Has there ever been an instance in the history of the HRC in your experience with it where we have defined height in this way? No, but I have also only been here for about <laughs> nine years and we have not had any large scale commercial yeah. projects in Belmore Village. But you've had to measure height on other new construction applications, correct? Well, I think, I think typically we would um, certainly take into consideration how it's measured based on the, like how underlying zoning would calculate um, the height of the highest occupied floor or the ceiling. That would be the, how we would measure it from like a, just a basic underlying zoning standpoint. But then there's also like, I think you could think about it from a form perspective as well, That's a yellow um, jacket. which is sort of just... Jacket. <laughs> Never I don't mess. Sorry. <laughs> it's a yellow jacket. Oh. Oh. Sorry. That's not as good as your hammer. Thank you. Right? <laughs> I could have thrown it to you. You could have taken it right good care of it. Last. Not fast enough. <laughs> I mean, for the commercial building, my brain says to measure it from the ground to the to the top of the parapet wall. If um, you're looking at a, at a building that has a more complex roof structure, then you might measure it to a certain place within a gable end or a hip roof. Like a mid to the mid, mid, mid point of a gable roof is what I'm typically, from the average grade around the perimeter of the building is what I'm mostly familiar with. That's how I would interpret no. it. Um, if I were, you know, advising you sitting in your seat. I, but the, and then I, I see what you were pointing out about the um, building too, you know, certainly I, when I'm looking at it because of the gamber roof being, um, you know, the, the sides of the roof facing the sides of the structure, then it's, you're looking at the facade straight on, then I would measure it to the peak of the roof. Um, Alex, you mentioned in your report that there's been some changes to the language uh, we're spending a good amount of time talking about the Grand Bohemian and the process that that went through and its approval. And it sounds like there's been a, ch a change specific to height in how that the, um, the standards under which that building was reviewed in comparison to this one. And I would love a little deeper understanding of that change. Sure, I, I would too. I wish somebody could come back from the past and enlighten me a little bit. <laughs> well, but there was a... That, we, had, we had flexible development standards mm -hmm. that were allowed for the commission to basically flex the underlying zoning standards. And that's usually the intent would be if there's something that isn't aligning right with, with what the 
design standards are, and they're usually more restrictive, so then you guys can then flex something. But that, um, number one, we had a city, a previous city attorney who said that would be like granting a variance, and that is not something that the HRC has authority to do, so it was taken out of our development ordinance. And additionally, I was a little surprised in reading the the flex standards sort of were written sort of that like the planning and urban design director kind of authorized the flex, but to my understanding that these design standards have not changed since they were adopted in 1988 and the development plan in 1991 or 92, then that it sort of seems like the HRC kind of went beyond what their own standards allowed at the time. Um, but you know, our meeting minutes are pretty limited that are in the file and so I can't really get my head around the whole um, gist of that conversation. I think where they maybe found the sweet spot for that project was, was ensuring that the height didn't exceed the gable end height of the, the church uh, gable ends, which I think um, Robert sent to me earlier, which are 44 feet. And then he also sent me a, a couple of drawings, one that is um, just of a, a Richard Sharp Smith original drawing that shows a cottage type structure that I, I was about two and a half stories if you want to look at that there in your in your packet and then he also sent that in a side by side with the the building to the sod that I just got right when we sat down so that's in there as well and I can certainly pull that up for y'all's benefit since it's just in our packet and that wasn't you know in the in the project folder from that that we had from you all so um I mean, I think the other thing that maybe different, differentiates the Bohemian site in my mind is that it's mostly on the north end of the district and not fully within it, right. um, like this site is. Um, that being said, you know, obviously it's a, I would applaud the team for their, you know, their, for their thoughtfulness and the design, of course, and so I'm hoping that we can figure out the issues around I, um, and I will say that um, Commissioner DeSacy corrected me on my bullet point number two. It was, um, look at my digital version of my staff report. It's Hendersonville Road is identified as sub area one, which is high density highway commercial, zero setbacks, full block development, multiple deck parking facilities, storefront development, and sidewalk two to three and a half stories. Um, in architectural language to draw from original commercial style buildings or multiple bay buildings, which those are, you know, there are um, visual examples of those in the development um, book or plan. So I think we're just in a little bit of a funky spot. And my, to me, like, I think that there could be a little bit more work done to the Hendersonville Road facade to make that feel a little less vertical. But the more challenging side to me is the side on Kitchen Place because I feel like the scale is really like stepped down on that particular side when you're kind of, as you feel within the district and these buildings, like they're, you know, pretty tall comparatively, so. Um, so I think what I, I think it's clear we're going to spend an enormous amount of time talking about building height. I think that <laughs> seems like the direction the conversation is going to head. Um, I will say I, I, I appreciate your presentation. I think that um, it's clear as a team that you've been extremely thoughtful and sensitive to the development of this district. And so I think I, um, I appreciate that attention to detail and I appreciate the story that you're creating and I think that it's um, it's a well-suited story for this property. Um, I think we're going to talk a lot about building height. Um, I would like to just pause maybe for a second because I feel like maybe there's some other people that would like to say things under the heading of public comment mm -hmm. um, that might help us with that conversation in some broader context, um, if you don't mind. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to open you. the floor for com public comment if there are those that would like to to say something. My name is Robert Griffin. I uh, personally petitioned the city of Asheville to create the historic district. I was the author of the development plan and I am the preservation architect for the cathedral. Um, 
given those three hats that I wear, uh, Christian Sotile called me and asked if I would sit down with him and kind of give him a lay of the land and see what I could do to uh, make sure that they knew what was coming uh, before they got there. And we went over his drawings. I have to tell you, at first, I was like, I don't think I want to be involved in this thing. I don't, I don't want. My, I don't want to be associated with the big grand bohemian stuck on that lot. And I went into the meeting with that attitude, and he totally turned me around when he showed me the way he had divided it into four separate buildings. I thought, all right, this is somebody that really wants to work with scale and, and not plop a big bohemian in the center of the village. And uh, we went through and we looked at, uh, at stories and I was looking at the development plan, two and a half stories, three and a half stories, and I told Christian, I said, you know, the development plan is pretty diagrammatic. I just split that lot down the middle, put two and a half stories on the kitchen place side and put three and a half stories on the Hendersonville side, but really I probably should have turned the two and a half stories around onto Angle Street. And he was like, yeah, yeah, I agree, you know. So I, I'm, I'm finding out that I'm working with somebody that is uh, professional and conscientious and creative. And so uh, at first he had a enlarged cottage form where that building is that kind of resembles the parish hall. And we worked together because I wanted to see the bay spacing not be so wide. Uh, because the bays, when you compare them to cottages, I've been guilty of that myself. There's a building on the corner of, um, of All Souls Crescent and Angle Street that we added a second story on. And it seems a little out of scale with the cottages. It's pretty close to them. And so I cautioned him. I said, look, you just don't want to take a cottage and put it in an enlarger graph and blow it up. It's just not going to look right at that scale. So he actually uh, completely changed his drawings, took, took that enlarged cottage out, and started working with the form that was a smaller base spacing that he derived from the parish hall. And, you know, I, I was thinking everything was looking pretty good until I got the sections and started studying them last night, and I realized the first floor is 20 foot tall. And that's when it hit me as to how big these were. Uh, and I have heard the expression, no good deed goes unpunished. But I really was there trying to help. And by focusing on the number of stories, uh, it, it, I didn't have dimensions until the book came out. So I didn't uh, get out the scale and scale them. But I do think that you're working with a high class architect and organization. And I know everybody on the Historic Resources Commission to be workable. And I think that the two of you together can sort through these uh, issues uh, with scale because I think you've got a team that I have found to be as workable as any other developers I've ever worked with. So um, I look forward to seeing what you all come up with together. Thank you. Thanks. My name is Martha Fullington, and I'm a retired preservation specialist, architectural historian. I was with the State Office of South Carolina and North Carolina for some 15 years. And when I retired, I started being on HRC. So for nine years, I sat where you're all sitting as a HRC member. And I sat for six years in your space as the chairman of, H of HRC. So you may not have these in your file, but I remember some of the discussions about facade height in Biltmore Village. And uh, we considered that as, a, as an elevation. And so the facade height was the height of the elevation and not just 
the height of a portion of that elevation. Uh, so I think that that might come into play as we look at this now. Um, the scale is something that uh, is definitely concerning. And I go back to that first, maybe the first picture that you showed where you were showing, where you were trying to step down to go even with the cathedral cross gable, not the tower, but the cross gable. And so uh, that's what they also used when they did the Bohemian, because their architect came over and met with me when they started on that. And he said, we do not want to exceed the height of that cross gable in any way. Um, so that was good that we had an opportunity to work with them then. Um, these folks have been stellar as far as reaching out to work with us and wanting to make sure that the cathedral was on board as they were respecting us and, and trying to build in a way that was going to be a good neighbor. Uh, when you come down the front steps of the church and you look out, you see Building 3. You walk out and you see the spa in, in its height and everything else. And so for them to um, be considerate of us being that close to this construction, we really do appreciate that. And um, we appreciated the presentation that they made to us some time back. Then it went pretty quiet for a good long while. And so we really didn't, we didn't get a notice of the HRC meeting at the church, which would have been nice. We would have liked to have known so we could prepare for this, uh, for one thing. Uh, and I'm thinking too, uh, you know, that's a multiple resource nomination for uh, a historic, it's not, you're not a basic historic district nomination, but multiple resource. But there are numerous landmark buildings in that multiple resource nomination. But as far as landmark designation, it's always been treated as a district. And so anything that went on in that district had to get a certificate of appropriateness. And we really didn't parse it down that much to contributing and non-contributing. Although we've experienced both because our church office building is a more modern, a 19 50s or 60s building, and then you've got the Hunt Cathedral right across from that. So we've dealt with both sides of that, and I'll have to go back and review uh, all the rules of a, net, of a multiple resource nomination, because that was kind of an odd duck that was introduced about halfway through my time with doing National Register stuff. Um, but anyway, I hope that this is a preliminary step to working together to come up with something stellar for Biltmore Village. Um, when I first heard about that, people said, oh, you know, it's, it's going to be uh, horrendous. Uh, people at All Souls alternately know me as the advisor for historic preservation for the Properties Commission of the Church, and then other people refer to me as the commissar <laughs> of historic preservation <laughs> for the properties at the church um, because I protect this building with all my might. It's the only Richard Morris Hunt church left in the world. Of the six he built, five have burned or been demolished, and this is it. This is the only one. And so our dedication to being good stewards of that place is overboard. And I go a little wacko when people start talking about major development. These folks put my mind at ease, however. Um, if, if, you're going to have this kind of development in Biltmore Village. I think that these folks working with Robert Griffin, our church architect, I think that it can be done uh, successfully. Um, so continue to address the questions that you were addressing, Alex. I think that they were all valid. And I look forward to following this as you proceed. Uh, and for um, you folks, I really appreciate your keeping us up to date at this point, and we look forward to being in that loop until the very end, so there aren't surprises. So thank you so much. Thank you all. We, yeah, we drove over here together, and it was kind of a, a comic thing with the seats going back and forth. But, um, <laughs> So I'm Dean Sarah Herbert. I'm the Dean of All Souls Cathedral. And uh, I want to uh, underscore what uh, you just heard 
and uh, especially relationally um, speaking, we find um, Grand Bohemian to be wonderful neighbors um, and to be an enhancement to the village. We find uh, that this, the idea of developing this space, which is, you know, an empty parking, well, not empty, I mean, there are cars, but I mean, it's, you know, it's not a whole lot to look at when you step outside the church, right? And so the idea of having something that is this, um, I think, visually stunning as well as um, compatible uh, is appealing to me. Now, I have to tell you, under threat of punishment, um, that I in no way uh, represent the entirety of my church. And if everybody here who goes to a church, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, so um, there are obviously lots of different opinions, you know, when it comes to that. But as far as the historicity, the addition and enhancement to the area, as well as working with um, with Christian and, the, and having many questions lobbed at the engineers and different folks, um, they've been incredibly responsive. And obviously, there's a lot of ground to cover, not just historically, but also, you know, when it comes to dealing with water and things of, those, things of that nature. And what I can tell you as I'm standing here is that I have faith. Now, that shouldn't be surprising, but <laughs> I, I do have faith that this is, um, this is a project that I think is going to um, enhance the area tremendously. And I absolutely, like Robert said, I do feel like there's going to be a solution that's going to come out of this that's going to be, that's going to be suitable for everyone involved. Um, and for my part and for the leadership and the staff at All Souls, if there's anything we can do for you all as far as access to any of our facilities or anything like that, please let us know. And uh, I'd also love your help at some point of talking to somebody about fixing the daggum sod box in front of our building. But, you know, that's it. <laughs> Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, we'll close the floor for public comment. And I realize that we maybe didn't get through all of your people. I don't know, Stephen Lee, no, if you had anything you wanted to add or anything. They're available for questions. Um, you know, obviously I said we're going to talk about height for a little while probably, but I think what I would, I think what we need to get to a place where there is a solution, because I would hate for um, this, us to get lost in the weeds of all of that. I think we just need to all sort of get honest about how tall the buildings are a little bit, and that the parsing of where the roof line starts, the scale of these buildings is tall. And I think um, there's plenty of places and plenty of examples throughout the entirety of all four facades that are um, much higher than 30 feet. And we have some stories that we can measure from the, um, from the various sides of the property in terms of how many stories we're allowed to have. But we also have language that says the facade shouldn't be more than 30 feet. And if we can all agree that a facade isn't just to the eave of the roof, especially in a case where we have a lot of wall space that goes much taller than that and gable ends that go taller than that, then you know, getting honest about that conversation I think is gonna help us and being really frank about it is gonna help us. And I think the third part of that, where we've got stories and we've got height, we also scale. And that there are gestures that we can make that help with the human scale of these buildings along different street frontages. And, um, and all three of those things, we've got to have some integrity around so that we can build a story about approval that meets all of those requirements. And, um, and I think one of the things in the, the stage that you are in design and the way that the, the project's being presented at this point, we're flat. And so that elevation looks like it's four stories tall. And in reality, much of that building is set way back on the site. And there is a very different scale on, along Kitchen Street that maybe is still too tall, but it isn't four stories. And what we're seeing behind there in this flat elevation is um, at some point, I think we want to 
be able to look at massing that lets us understand better stepping and variety in how the block is put together. That's my recommendation, I think, for how we frame the conversations. Can I add or to or build on what you've said? Yes. I think it would also help to have some contextual drawings that show these buildings in relation to the other surrounding buildings, to New Morning Gallery. Not just the Grand Bohemian, which is Caddy Corner, but to the buildings you know, on the, the streets adjacent to this property, not just All Souls. All Souls is outstanding, and I'm delighted and, and gratified to know that you've done that outreach. But the other three sides, I, I think it would be helpful to have some contextual work that shows the height and scale of this development relative to those other, um, those other street planes. Um, and I'm thinking of uh, the section in chapter three on form and scale that says new buildings should appear similar in mass and scale with historic structures typical of the sub area. And to Mr. Griffin's point, you don't just put a building on a, a copier and click enlarge, which with the building two is kind of what I see, where it's a three-story building but when you look at the, the, the inspiration for that design, those are much smaller, both in size and in scale. So that's going to be a very delicate balance, I think. Um, yeah. Well, uh, do you happen to know the height, the typical height of one of the cottages from, to, to I'm sorry, to get really detailed on height, from, say, grade to roof ridge? I, I don't know that. Okay. But I know the height of, to, to the context question that we gave, the building is 31 feet, and we're proposing building that Again, but it's really 40. What's the McGahee building? It's the mixed use neighbor to the to building one. Uh, Boston, uh, way, Boston way and yeah, it's, kitchen. So it's the building next door. Okay. Um, it's that, that beautiful brick building with the with the terracotta incense. So I know I, we have we certainly can draw that, um, okay. but we studied that too to understand. Yes, this this is a story taller. It's, it's right. but. Yeah. Um, but certainly drawing that will, will help illustrate it. Um, well, and then in, in, in respect to the cottages versus this part of the village, I do, I, you know, just from a, from a the standpoint of sort of understanding we're, we're in an area that's, that this, this portion of the site is, um, uh, at least the portion along Hendersonville is zoned as like high, high intensity highway commercial, or high intensity commercial. So we're building sort of that context, not the cottage context. Uh, you know, here, but but we have to know how it relates. I, I'm not disagreeing. Which gets to exactly where I was going. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes drawing from the cottage context is not always the best thing to do, and that's why I got into the question of what are the contributing and non-contributing resources because what creates that tout ensemble, if you would, of the district? What is the character of the Biltmore Village District? And we see on Kitchen Place that the character is different from the cottages. So is it necessarily appropriate to always draw from the cottage context? So if we're looking at you know, the, the entirety of the district, is it appropriate to a cottage for the purpose of the, the minutes that was an enlarged? That was the copier. Yes. Um, um, I, I can 
my laptop back up if it's helpful for everyone to see, but there's, um, Robert sent me earlier today, there's a folder, subfolder, that just, I think it's at the top of the list, it says additional um, images received today. One of them shows, I think the first PDF shows um, the, um, it's, the, it's one of the original cottages drawn, superimposed onto the plan with the <coughs> building two elevation. Do you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. Do you all want me to put this up? No. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, you could send I, it to me. Yeah, I got it. I think she's going to bring it up. Uh, it's, don't ask me about this it, computer. Is it there? <laughs> there being a bad thing It's not. It's just not. Doesn't want to play. No, it doesn't. Thinks it's money. It is not. <laughs> and it's. I've got my screen um, so weird right now. I just don't understand it. Yeah, I'm not in support of the project shown in front of us today. For um, I think when I read the development plan, it, it talks about getting out of the train station, looking down, and the scale of the buildings taper down to the. All souls to make it even more grand and there's probably a way to do that that I'd like to see where the heroes of, of Biltmore Village are the train station the Biltmore uh, the Richard Hunt um, uh, Biltmore estate and office and also Souls Cathedral is the is the centerpiece that everything fans toward that's or from me. and this is a distractive, multiple material that I think can work in if it's scaled. That I'd love to see something scaled back that uses commercial brick as the standards talk about in commercial structures. These more primarily brick, and um, that's a, um, an important. Part for me, the 30 foot move I already talked about, the, the ornamental trim applied in a similar manner that we see in the district um, seems a little, and I can't tell if it's from the um, um, architectural drawings or it would help if we see some um, other renderings. It seems a little excessive and ornate and taking some things from that Richard Morris hunt and putting it on your building where it stands purely and it was a full part of the Bill Morris State uh, office building but you're taking the corner out of you know how the stone interacts with the brick or anyway it seems like you need um, a, a singular message that varies in setback as the standards say on long stretches um, the dead zones that are created along Hendersonville Road and uh, across from New Morning Gallery, where there is no um, interaction with the public. Um, you know, Hendersonville Road can change one year, and it may not be a four-lane road that barely holds four lanes. And um, it would be nice if this structure could play into that um, as, as roads calm down. Another reason was they had subdivided surfaces, with setbacks, um, the brick, the brick pattern on some of the sidewalks, uh, herringbone, not as much as uh, the regular brick is what I see a lot. Um, I think herringbone is called out in standard, so. It is? Yeah, I think, I think it has both. I think that there the is sidewalks? some herringbone there. Is yeah. that for the sidewalks? Yeah. Yeah, there is some. Okay. Um, and activated street, the density of trees along Hendersonville Road seems excessive compared to everywhere else in the district, or it's really dense compared to across the street, down the street, and other streets, uh, just the number of trees. Yeah. Um, anyway, that's what I'd like to see on another plan is something that's this is a single-use building with other, with a, you know, a hotel restaurant um, and a spa doesn't have to look that unique to each other and distract from the main point of, of what I see in the development 
uh, standards as focus on the church. Can I just jump in and say one thing about yeah. the landscaping along Henderson Mill Road? So DOT does not like trees. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm just going to be honest. No. Um, so they're, that's why they're showing dogwood trees. There. Those are dogwood. Yeah, there's, uh, and I think there's one plan where it looks like there's a bunch, but I, I don't think it's, I don't, I didn't think it was excessive. And just to say, too, that I didn't mention when I was doing my staff report, they are showing um, some smaller um, plantings within the planting strip there, which the original plan doesn't call for that. They call for grass. But I think, honestly, on that particular street, it will help from a pedestrian experience. It is a scary place to walk. Mm -hmm. So this will be a vast improvement. And removing the power lines along, I don't know if that was part of it, I didn't see that in there, but it's also in the standards that removing power lines where you can uh, would also help break up that, uh, those poles in the cycle. I'd like to commend you. I, it's clear that you did a tremendous amount of work, and I think you are being clearly from, you know, the folks that you've really been trying to work with everyone. Uh, I, too, am having trouble with the massing and the scale. Um, the Grand Bohemian, to me, is not the building that you want to be related to as much. It's not a historical building. It is on the outskirts kind of of you know, as much as I love, I think they make some of the best cocktails in Asheville. Um, and I look forward to the new bar that you built. But I think it it just, it feels a little busy. Um, and I think it it just needs to come down just a little bit. Would, to me, feel like it, it could go that way. But I really, I, I respect what you've done. It's a lot of work. The renderings are beautiful. It's just too big. Thank you. I, I also want to commend tall. you on having moved here from yeah. Savannah. I can tell you that everything Christian does is lovely and <laughs> thoughtful. And, and I really appreciate all the attention to, to the detail. I appreciate the different, you know, the four different buildings and the different perspectives. I think that's a, a really one of my favorite things about the project. I do have a problem with the size, the massing, I think is a little big, but, but I, I think the design is lovely. Alex, were you going to show something contextual? You, I thought you said you had some, something that it's not showing. Up. Christian just asked me to email it to him. Oh, OK. You want to look at it first? We have it in our We have you all it. had it. Did yeah, it came today, and I just hadn't seen it. It, yeah, it wasn't part of it. I hadn't seen it in our packet yet. But I, I, the thing that you yeah. were pointing to, I, I see now. It's just when there's a presentation and there are people that are commenting, they you want see. everybody to have the same information. So, yeah, yeah. And especially if this gets continued for more information, then if it, if it warrants everybody yeah. seeing it and, and it, talking about yeah. it, then you No, can. I know, but I asked him, and they've all seen it. So he's representing the team. So if you want your team to see it, then I'm Sure, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Can you can um, you just plug in? Oh, you've got it. Yeah, but I don't need to plug in. That's terrible. Um, Sorry, I need the space. You know, I think that some of the challenge that the the massing, uh, one one of the culprits maybe of some of the massing. I think Robert, you mentioned this. The you know twenty foot floor to floor on the first level is really tall, and I know it's because there's the ballroom right there, <laughs> and it's driving the whole rest of the first floor. Um, I know how accessibility works, but um, you know, I wonder what happens if that just sort of went into the second floor and you just had this, you could drop everything and sort of make that volume. I know you lose rooms and you lose things, but it may sort of start to help you talk about how to get the building. Um, you know, we've, we have to write a motion around things that we can tie to the standards and we can't tie it to Grand Bohemian because that's, um, you know, it's part of the precedent and part of the story and part of the scale in the district, but it isn't. Uh, we have a lot of the this lot and block that speaks to something else, and uh, that's the place where I think 
um, looking at the massing in more than just flat as you continue to develop the design and refine the design and um, and edit where you where you uh, where you can and should. Uh, I think we will get a little bit better sense of those massing gestures that you are starting to make in response to the cathedral and response to kitchen place and some better, some broader context of what's next to it on other sides and not just catty quarter from the Grand Bohemian. You know, I think the gable change from the hip roofs at the, um, at the Grand Bohemian to the gables here isn't helping the height conversation. I think there's a clearer, much clearer, stronger roof line that, um, that I think creates the story that you're hoping to tell here, which is we put a whole bunch of stuff in the roof that helps the scale come down, but the gables and the tall facades are, um, are not uh, helping you in that conversation. And so I think most of us are going, well, what's to the, to the height of the bridge? And it's not 30 feet. And how do we talk about that in a context that lets us say yes to something, even if it's not 30 feet? And, uh, and how do we do that in the standards? And also, you know, being responsive to the fact that y'all have um, the project evolution has a really compelling story to it in terms of the effort it's making I would add to that that building three does do a good job of responding to the site and staying in line with the standards though um, I think that one is successful and I would take the argument of the 30 height to the underside of that roof because of how that building is formed and from what I can see from from the um, elevation so I think that one is really successful um, I am not as um, against as some of the other folks on the on the committee here uh, with building four um, I feel like but I, I do think that there um, uh, that buildings one and two need to be shown in the in the context of the rest of Biltmore Village a little bit more than uh, your site context sections only showed one building of this on the site, and that was All Souls, and there are the other ones there. So I think that would be helpful to see it with that, as well as the, the massing 3D renderings or model or something to show what the setbacks do. Um, beautiful, uh, beautiful drawings, uh, lovely um, watercolors and sketches, really spectacular. I can, we can see you're paying attention um, to bigger things and smaller things. That. So, uh, really clear with that. So, thanks for that clarity. Other um, comments from commissioners? Um, I would like to say that as the as the design evolves, I I think you've been very successful in how you've broken up the components, as others have said. And that creates variety. It allows for increased, uh, you know, visual and physical differentiation along those facade planes and in perspective. I hope that as the design evolves, you can retain those components and not lose that differentiation and variety um, because it sounds like madam chair what you might be saying is you know perhaps maybe backing <laughs> off on some of the detail and maybe simplifying is that is that a correct I mean interpretation? I, th I think you know there's a lot going on and I also appreciate the, the uh, variety and I think that it helps with the scale yes. and the context where we're really, really responsive in all four directions. Um, I do think there's a, maybe some editing and some, um, you know, some, just some refinement that happens that maybe yeah. does take um, so much detail and sort of um, focus that in key moments. Yeah. And, um, and that literal copying of historic detail 
not always appropriate, um, but that it does uh, some refinement to that. There's a sophistication about that that I think is lovely um, when you put it, when you look to that context in a new building. Um, so I also don't want to lose that, right? We don't. This isn't just um, you know shrink everything and and erase it all, right? <laughs> this is this is. Um, this is, you know, and the process evolves and you keep talking about it and you wake up in the middle of the night and you go, I should have drawn that thing really differently and I, I figured it out because it was always bugging me and now I want to do it something different. But, um, you know, so I think that um, I, my presumption, and this is a presumption on my part, is that y'all are expecting to get feedback from us that you would take back and continue your work. Um, so I think the goal for us today is for commissioners who all have things that uh, what they would like to say for y'all to hear that, but for also for you to ask any questions of us that are specific things that you're looking for feedback on mm -hmm. so that the conversations that we're having are most productive and that you can continue to move the project forward um, considering the things that we've, that we've said that, um, that help us all move towards a place where we, have a, we can you know, put a motion together. So if there's things that you are missing from feedback from us, I think that would be, um, you know, you're, please ask. Yeah, no, I, I really appreciate that question. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate everyone's feedback. This is, there's a lot, of, a lot of great voices here and not everyone's saying the same thing and that's the way it is. I get it. Um, we, as I, as I said, we have worked so hard on what we've brought to you, so we're in love with it. Um, uh, so I, I'm, you know, you know, like anything, you have to sort of process and think about what, what you're hearing. Um, I do, I, I will say, like with any project, we're doing something very ambitious here, you know, to create this kind of a quality project. And there are program realities to doing that. And, and our work with, with the All Souls over really going back to October of last year, we removed two floors from, you know, from those buildings that were closest, which was, it threw us into a tailspin because we had to really re like oh my gosh how are we going to get this to work so what we brought we felt really good about knowing that there are things that are a bit taller than what's there we are this is a different era just as you know Olmstead and, and 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 Smith and Hunt didn't see the you know the early 20th century mercantile buildings coming you know but they came because that's history is being made and I feel like we're making history here in Biltmore Village and so there's a boldness needed and so we wanted to present something thoughtful yes it is bold we we know that we're trying to balance a program and push it as hard as we can to keep it as respectful as it can be and i want to keep working on that but i guess i would we certainly brought you a, a whole package you know with the hope that you know with that idea that you know you you could opine on it you could look at what conditions could be made specifically i think we've had a kind of a broad conversation tonight which is great um but I, 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 I don't know how to ask this exactly. I feel like I would want to present the pos, like just reflect on it, and but, but be able to not bring back a fully formed package. There's a ton of work here, a ton yeah. of work. This is not, you know, I'll be back tomorrow. I mean, this is like two years of work. So right. I, I want to sort of, you know, with, in a collaborative way with this team, if you're open to it, to kind of work through paths that you, will feel are the right paths for the project, even, even if there's not 100% agreement, that there's consensus, because this is tough work. Um, I, and, and I really appreciate all of your, your time volunteering to be a part of those conversations. I know that's not easy. So um, for us, I think, um, I don't, uh, maybe just some thought, if you think there's a path forward, I think I'm hearing there, there is, um, I, 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 just being able to, kind of re, um, revisit it with you all as, as we give it some thought to, to see if there's ways we might think about the, the roof forms differently, um, knowing that we have these metrics and we have, you know, the language that was written in some cases many years ago, you know, we're, we're dealing with all of that and you all have to deal with that and I do understand that. So what flexibilities you think you have to, you know, see this, see this uh, through with the um, with the ordinances that we have in place. I, I guess that's maybe that's a question, but I don't know. And I think that this body lacks authority to um, 
decide something that doesn't align with the standards. And so the conversations that we have and the motions that we put together have to connect us back to those standards because we don't have a, the authority to say, well, this one isn't really applicable. You know, we can't just say, well, 30 feet doesn't matter. Or, um, but we have, to, we have to craft a motion that tells, that connects ourselves and our reasoning mm -hmm. to what it says in the standards. And I think ultimately it's your, um, and you know this because you, this isn't the only HRC you've ever stood in front of, but you know, you've got the burden of helping us create that message and telling us in the ways in which that you think you're well aligned with, with, with the standards. I think as a process moving forward, um, really massing is the big question and, and that time spent um, working through that together and the work that you're going to do in the meantime until the next meeting is probably the most productive way for us to spend our time and that the details and the, the way the buildings relate mm -hmm. on their various facades to their, their neighbors and to um, their views or whatever I think is uh, maybe the easy part um, for the commission and that the big hurdle is going to be the massing and so spending some time thinking through those that feedback that we've given and really connecting yourself to the standards and helping us um, see a path through the ordinance that lets us make a motion that says, yeah, we can support this building at this size. I think some massing studies that let us look three-dimensionally might help because I recognize that we, you are stepping the property and it's difficult to read that flat because we see the tall things always behind us. And so, that feels like a productive way for you to evolve the work that you're doing is focusing maybe less on the details at this stage and more on the massing and that that will feel That's right helpful. and that, and that um, I think the details will help. The other thing I would just that, say that you. I think helps my mind also have faith that we can come to a, <laughs> a place is that the well, we have the design guideline or standards book, right? But then we have the development plan that speaks to the number of stories. And I think if you're thinking about that from the intent of the redevelopment plan and the and the actual forms in the district, then I, I feel like those two meeting together clearly give a path forward. But mm -hmm. yeah. like to I would commissioners' agree. feedback points that they've made, I think it's just a little more study of how the massing might change a little bit and how it might relate to the other uh, to the scale of the buildings around it um, and I don't really know exactly how you work Christian having only seen this like beautifully polished finished package but I staffers and lots of times look at conceptual renderings yeah, as well yeah. in the, in the interim yeah. um, so if you, if you want me to try to weigh in before you bring anything back to the commission I'm happy to help your team in that regard but I'll obviously leave that up to your preference thank you okay yeah no, that's great I think thank that you. would be true too for what the commission looks at mm -hmm. in terms of you know if the expectation is another sort of working meeting like this one you know we don't need watercolor renderings every single time you come here right so there's um, or studies of different options that work with your objectives from a pro forma sort of a standpoint mm -hmm. that also speak to some of the responses that you got. I think um, we've got a pretty um, good amount of folks that can visualize and have been doing this for a while. Um, so complete finished isn't necessary either. Mm -hmm. Understanding that you put a lot of time into what you do. Thank you, that's very helpful. Yeah, I, I only review watercolor right oh, now. Yeah. <laughs> you have to sit this one out. I, guess. <laughs> I, um, I think it would be helpful to come to some understanding of what we mean by a primary facade and how that's measured, or else we're just going to keep circling around. Yeah. Is it measured to a cornice? Is it top of the parapet? Is it halfway I mean, up a cable? Yeah, the definition, the yeah. Line? The definition of facade is pretty um, non-specific, right? It just says like the front of a building, <laughs> and it's, so. But it also says two to three stories. Well, the development ordinance does. The um, 
the development plan is the one that talks about story. So we're going to have to sort of work ourselves between those two things a little bit, I think, to get to where we need to be on height. Um, but I think that from my perspective, I'm not going to stop looking at the building at the eve of that of those roofs. That's, I mean, to me, it's because we're looking at so many different forms mm -hmm. melded together, I feel like defining it is going to make it more limiting than it is. Yeah. Well, and it's maybe intentionally vague so that we're allowed to have these conversations and uh, give applicants a path towards compliance with the guideline or the standards. I mean, that quite yeah. the development plan on the, on the Hendersonville Road side that says three and a half stories. There's, I don't know that you can build, I mean, I guess you could build a commercial building that was 30 feet tall, three and a half stories, but that, that's not likely. Most not if you'd like any air conditioning in it. Most people family houses we see are close to 30 yeah. feet tall. So I just think that, again, it's more of like the meeting between the intent, mm -hmm. the form of the district, more than, I don't know, I, I wish yeah. that the 30 foot I wish is, it wasn't there a little bit. I think it kind of, it does... To me, it gets in the way a little bit of the, of the form, not entirely, because I think all the buildings are pretty modestly scaled in the district. But, um, and I, can, I mean, I, I, I can understand the point of, you know, certainly this type of development is never going to be able to built on this site if we're saying 30 only 30 feet. feet. Right. I don't know what's going to get built there. Another bank. But, <laughs> McDonald's. Um, anyways, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I'll leave it up to the commission, obviously, yeah. if you all want to define what facade and how that's measured, but I feel like there might be a little more wiggle room if we're talking about it from a form and overall height. Well, I mean, I think that, together. you know, roofline is going to contribute to how we feel about it. Yeah. I think. Does anybody else have thoughts? I mean, I agree. I think that that's part of the equation. I was going to say that it might be helpful. These are some of our most complex design, I mean, guidelines, standards, because there are four, four books and a development plan that go with Biltmore Village. So today I've heard people quoting from the standards, several different ones, and I don't always look at your packet. So I'm focusing on what are the standards you're focusing on. And I don't know if it might be helpful to be sure that those standards that you're all focusing on are pulled out, and maybe Alex has already done this in your packet, so that the applicants are also focusing on those same ones. And there might be different interpretations, and as you were saying, Emily, you know, we, we can't be flexible on our standards, but often the way the standards are written, allow they for allow for some flexibility within the context of, and that's usually where you come back to. What is it contextually? What does that mean? What does mass mean by itself? You can't just say this. Right. There's never going to so just be one sentence. If it's read. helpful yeah. to you all, I don't, again, if Alex has maybe already pulled out, these are some of the standards. The applicant had mentioned the, the one about the primary facade not exceeding 30. And then, Alex, actually, I was a little confused by this district, no, sub area, the sub area discussion. And were you saying that in some sub area, the part of this building is in one sub area, and would is there ever a height that is allowed higher than 30 feet in one sub? It, or it's, the, it's sub, the sub area doesn't have a dimension; it just has a number of stories. Which it just I has the stories, which, which is I think is where the place that we can that you all can you know, diverge okay. from the being really strict on the 30 foot dimension. Okay. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean because I think, like you're saying, I think it's an interpretation thing. A context. Um, and do you have a map that has sub area and then maybe this development within the... It's in the, like, it's in the development plan. Yeah, and the and pages you are all listed in my staff report that I need to okay. So, Alex... All right, that's if, helpful. If as long as everybody has seen yeah. this, what he's just pointing out, which is... Yeah. If, Alex, if there's these two conflicting guidelines, standards that... Are influencing this how do we how do we discern between the two I mean I know that as an architect if there's two if there's two code things you pick the more stringent one every time do you but mean this because is the block is 
Well, because well, because we have got the 30 foot thing, and then we've also got the three and a half stories, and like we're talking about, you can't really do the three and a half stories in 30 feet sure, as new construction. That's, that's what I'm saying is, I think it's a good thing that we have the development plan, yeah. because I think that gives you some and I think room for interpretation, and then also, um, you know, I think it's really, again, if you kind of just take a step and look at it from a big picture standpoint and think about the intent of the standards and the way they're written may not be perfect in our, you know, current way we want to, you know, word them in our minds, but if you're just thinking about it from the form and the rest of the district and kind of the scale of the rest of the district, I think it's easier to look at it from that perspective and maybe the intent of the redevelopment being more dense is clearly the intent of the development plan, mm -hmm. you know, along the Haywood or the Henderson Road mm -hmm. corridor. So, again, I think it's kind of, then you're talking about it's clearly going to be a commercial development. So it's probably, and, and, and the other thing to consider too is that they could be elevating this out of the floodplain and they're not doing that, which is great from a design perspective. Yeah. But we could be talking about something like at Brook Street, which is two and a half stories on top of the pedestal uh, yeah. the parking garage. So that's just another thing to consider that yeah. it is in the floodplain, and that just is the reality that we're in. And so, yeah. you know, I think they, you know, they're obviously putting all their parking underground um, and are flood proofing the building, so they don't have to put it on a pedestal. So just complicated more. I'll just throw that out there. Well, but there's, <laughs> and there's more in the standards than just the one sentence yeah. around 30 feet that talks about context mm -hmm. and scale and other, and other things that can help support a departure towards the development um, plan if we can't get to 30 feet or don't want to get to 30 feet or whatever, you know, how can we get yeah. there? So I think yeah. there's a, four books of information that can help support. Then you don't think, try not to think of it like you do as an architect going with an ordinance, right. which all city ordinances and planning ordinances or unified development ordinance will say if it's a conflict, you go with the less restrictive. Right. But right. that is not the case right. here. You're, you're working with all the standards and, and trying to figure that out within the context. So yeah. I think that to answer your question, it might be helpful for the next time for some of these things to say why you think that works in that situation and relate it to yeah. the you know these these documents as well the standards yeah yeah and the That's and the uh, development. Okay. Um, so I in the absence of further questions or comments. You might even, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm just reading it. I appreciate your, there, there are other things written in that paragraph that are all good things right. to work and from. Can't, and I might yeah. even say primary facades should not exceed 30 feet. Mm -hmm. From an ordinance writing point of view, that's, that's I hadn't really focused on it, obviously, but, you know, they're, they're certainly the you know, right. must what must and shalls, you know, may and should, yeah. Well, and if this so is the case where it should, we need the we need to support that in some way through the standards. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's really the maybe the focus of your next yeah. round. But I, I think I've, yeah, we've heard so much good good yeah. input from everyone. Um, so. At this point, if there's um, um, no other, go ahead. Chair Kite, sorry, we have public comments. Yes, if we okay. open the floor for public comment. I will be happy to open the floor for, for public comment. State your name for us again. I just have a brief comment. It won't take long. But um, it, as I developed the development plan along Kitchen Place, and you can look at the diagrams in the development plan, they really were intended to be zero lot line commercial buildings, not cottages. Mm -hmm. Um, and if, in fact, we thought of that street as more urban uh, rather than uh, cottage, that it might be possible to do a primary facade that goes up to 30 feet, and then how many architects are there here tonight? A whole bunch. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so you guys read Christopher Alexander's book on step back buildings. So could, could, you, could you go up 30 feet and then step back with a terrace and then go up further so that they can get their density in and we can create something. So I just wanted to throw those two ideas out there yeah. for everybody's consideration. Thank you. Thank you. 
Any additional public comment? We'll close the floor. Public comment. Um, procedurally speaking, if we're, we feel like we've done what we wanted to do today, your next um, step would be to request a continuance um, and at the microphone, um, and then we would figure out what's next, the dates and such. Emily, just yes. before, can we, can we say where this 30-foot standard shows up? Yes. yes. I have it down as book four. It's book three. It's book three. It's book three. Is there a page? Ch chapter yeah. four, book three. Book page 13, I believe. I think that's right. It's book right. three, it's chapter four. A part of it. Page 13. Three to 15. <laughs> It's not chapter one, four, book three. No, I'm just looking at 13 to 15. I thought it was 24. It's usually the kind of books I have, but I just didn't bring my standards. So. Okay, so it's book three, chapter four. Book, book no, three. sorry, that's a typo. It's book, it's book three. Book three, chapter four, page 13 to 15. It's page 13 for sure. I don't know which room chapter yeah. I can't remember. <laughs> okay. 60 <laughs> pages. Pilates, Pilates, four books of art. Um, so the schedule. Alex, the I'm going to enter. So I don't, we've got one more comment before okay. we get to continuance. Does it say you should have okay. yeah, yes. yes. I, I just want to address your observation of the term, or of, of use of the term should in the standards. Um, uh, one of my greatest complaints about many sets of design guidelines and design standards is that should, shall, must language, where I'm an enormous fan of you know very basic sentence structuring, and when it comes to revise, when it comes time to revise the guidelines, let's have a discussion about sentence diagramming. <laughs> but the intent of the word should is that you need to demonstrate why something can't. And when it can't, that justification needs to be rooted in the design standards and the context. So it, it, it's not just, it says should, that means we don't have to. That's not what that means. It's defined actually in chapter one that shall should use all are required. <laughs> I agree. So, so what does it say? What is the what is the definition? Words shall, should, and use um, mean that compliance is required. Okay. Approval. So it does. It, it's an obscure point. Probably. Thank you, that. Alex. Okay. I think now we're at the place where a continuance <laughs> would um, be the next step. I think. So, you're supposed to um, request a continuance for the dates. So I don't know how how you want to go about that and just ballpark the date, or or at the same time we could like say, I don't know, you give us a, a date within the next few months, and then you can if you need to request another continuance, you can, um, and then we can go from there. Um, so you can just you can request to continue to June, and then just let me know before the June meeting. If you want to and the forward. submittal date for June is what. Yeah, so it's like two weeks from today. What would what would the submittal date be for? I guess if we said June. the next cycle or the the cycle. May twenty fourth is the submittal date for the June meeting, which is two weeks. Okay. The turnaround's always. I guess what what I'm. What I'm hearing is that this board is open to sort of wor working on this in a bit of a workshop format, um, in, in which case we could focus more on solutions, less yeah, on I a think fully the detailed package. Work is fine as a if, presentation in the yeah. next meeting. I would say to try to keep, while it's all fresh in everyone's mind, why don't we seek that? Out? Certainly, if it's okay, then I could ask for. To, extension yeah, to the following meeting if we don't yeah, think it's fine. possible but it keeps us this is all very current now so I, I, why don't we ask for uh, uh, madam chairman may i request a continuance uh to, for a date certain for june. the june 14th. 14th 
14th. June 14th, yeah. So then we do a motion, right? We make a motion. Yes. Somebody makes a motion. You're it. Somebody do it. I move we continue this application to the June 14th meeting. And I second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Th thank you all. Yeah, thank you. That's fine. I was expecting I would take them to part of your office. Okay. I'll bring them back. But then you okay. have to carry them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you have to carry okay. them twice. That's totally fine. What you're comfortable with? We have a couple more items to get through. Yeah, no, that's fine. Not public mm -hmm. hearing items, so. But do you want to wait until they're um, done loading up stuff, or what? Uh, that's I, up to you. I don't know if anybody needs a break. If it would be, you know, I think we can get through power through. Yeah, power through. These these last two things are really quick. Um, Okay, so uh, we've got a couple of National Register nominations to get through. Um, the first one is the Boyce Kate and Kitsie McLam Miller House, uh, located at 5 Hemp Hill Road. Um, I guess it has a couple of other names, BK Miller House for short, we'll just say that for today. Um, it is representative of the rustic revival style. Um, and is one of the largest, most intact rustic revival style houses in Buckham County. And uh, this is the, the site is located um, just southeast of the parkway if you're going 74 towards Fairview. I've always been curious about this house because I lived right across the, or I lived on Bee Ridge across 74 for a long time and wondered about this property. Uh, so, um, you all act in an advisory capacity to the SHPO on uh, National Register nomination, so that's what we're here for today. And I have a form I need for you to sign, and it is, I think I have them with me. Um, so um, the, this particular property is um, being nominated under criteria C, which is design and construction, is one of the largest and most highly intact examples of the restaurant revival style in Buncombe County, as I said. Um, so, if you all have any, hopefully everybody had time to read the two nominations that were included in the packet, and all we basically need is a recommendation from the commission. So, um, Annie, I think, has maybe happy feelings about this project, about this property. <laughs> do, do we move? Do we? Do, do we move to uh, recommend approval? What's what do we actually? I, I can She's say I've been in this building. I consulted on this when the Laramores first acquired it, when I was still at the HPO, and this house is outstanding, and the landscaping is outstanding. Yeah. This place is amazing. It's a surprise when you drive by. It yeah. really is. It is. It's like a little oasis. It, it, like it, it is a, its own little oh, oasis, and the Laramores are wonderful. Um, so do we like do does does the board does someone move to recommend that the NRAC recommend approval because they're actually a recommendation making body? 
What we haven't do? gotten that in the weeds on it. We, I think okay. the HRC has just recommended approval in the past. It doesn't have to be one way or another. We don't really have any like formal rules around the motion for this. Okay. So, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be the one that that, that mm -hmm. jumps up and says I move we do whatever. It's okay. Well, does anybody have questions? If they don't, then. Um, 1930s, 36, yeah. Which is sort of, I think, that was common of that era. I guess there were a fair amount of vacation type second home or Rustic. mountain retreats that were built in this. Right, and then the. It's all the same. Yeah. And gash, the gash cottages, the gash farm cottages. I lived in one of those. The, the history around this was great. The, whoever wrote, they just put, the context was terrific, the way they built it. And it's Clay Griffith. He's one of our excellent local consultants. Yeah, he did a great job. All right. You ready? <laughs> Go, Go Annie. Do it. Oh. Go Annie. Does somebody need to second? Well, I mean, we don't do a formal motion. I'll second. No, you can do a formal no, motion. Oh. Um, then I, so I did, that was that was my ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll second it. So I we'll don't know that. Not that motion. No, no. <laughs> Wasn't enthusiastic or loud enough. Come on, Andy. <laughs> second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Hurry up. Okay. Um, I know we have some folks that have joined the commission since Walton Street Park and Pool came through for landmark designation, um, but the Walton Street Park was designated as our 50th local historic landmark in October. Um, it is one of our most historically significant, culturally significant um, sites related to the African American community here in Asheville. It's in the very south part of the south side. Um, and. What's important to note to you guys about the nomination for this property is that it, it's different than the landmark designation. So for those who weren't here to come along with us on the journey for the landmark designation, um, in this part, the, I would say that the black community has fought really hard for what little amenities that they have. For them to get this pool was like, a, a, you know, an act of God would be maybe an understatement. I think it was part of, it was a works progress administration funded project partly. Um, the community at one point tried to raise money for it because the city didn't want to pay for it itself, even simultaneous that we were funding Malvern Hills Park fully by city money. Um, and so it's got a very unique um, history in terms of its evolution over time. The city made the decision, not me, to move the pool use to a site down the street at the Grant Center, if you're familiar, that's community center about half a block away where they're built, they are in the process of building a new pool um, facility. And so this pool has not been in use for I think like five or six years now. Um, but those features were protected as part of the landmark designation. So when we were doing our community engagement for the landmark or historic designations just generally, we were dovetailing that with our parks department asked for what improvements, improved amenities the community wanted for the park because they had, city council had allocated um, about $500,000 total, I think, to make improvements to the park. And so those improvements do not involve the pool and pool house at this time, but other parts of the park. So what we heard from the community members at that time was that they really did not like the, the softball diamond. Not, they did not want that there, even though it had been constructed on the site in the 50s. Um, the basketball court also came in the 1960s, I believe. So if you're looking at the period of significance for the nomination, it says 1972. And the basketball court and the ball field are noted as contributing features. Um, because they were within the period of significance for the site. However, the landmark designation excluded them as contributing features because we felt that the pool and the pool house were the most um, significant site features to preserve and retain while kind of balancing that with the wants and needs of the community from a modern day amenity standpoint. 
I think the last thing we are prepared to do as a city is to go out in this community and say, here's what we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in any case, that's where they differ. The, we, I met with Shippo and the author of the report, as well as Jesse from the Preservation Society, since they funded the report, or the nomination, rather, to talk about it. Because originally, it was just they were just straight contributing features, but the Parks Department already has a certif certificate of appropriateness to remove the baseball field and install a multi-purpose walk field and walking track and to move the basketball court so that it's reoriented east or north to south and not east to west. So because that work is in progress already, then the basketball court hasn't been touched yet, so it's still listed as contributing baseball field the fencing and the lighting is all gone. So it was listed as not contributing, but documented kind of in progress so that we have that for our records moving forward. Um, we felt like that was the cleanest way to do the nomination. So that was a long story just to say that that's, it reads differently, but um, same same question. Um, hopefully you all su will support this nomination it's, um, as it meets National Register Criterion A. First Association with African American Ethnic Heritage, Social History, and Entertainment and Recreation. So, I move that we support this nomination. Was that too soon? <laughs> That's great. That's perfect. You guys got it. You're getting it dialed. Is there a second? A second. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. The next thing is the Historic Resources Champion Award. Everyone was amazingly quiet about oh the gosh, award this year. So next year, I'm going to. No, it's OK. We, we have two good nominees, Dale Slusser, who um, Annie so kindly put together a little short summary of his, um, his contributions that it's in your <coughs> packet. Um, and then um, Ben Mitchell, who was here a couple of meetings ago, um, put forth Jack um, Thompson previous director of the Preservation Society as a potential um, candidate as well. So that's really up to you guys to decide who you want to give the award to this year. <laughs> uh, give me a second. I gotta... Can you repeat the names? Um, first one that Annie recommended. Dale Slusser. Dale Slusser. S-L-U-S-S-E. I think that I don't know. I'm not a commissioner, but I would say Dale, I would say I would suggest Dale would be the. That's where I'm headed. Yeah. I mean, I think. I mean, I think Jack would make a great candidate as well, but perhaps because. That because Dale's name was put forth by a commission member, that might be most appropriate. Um, I also think you know, Jack, Jack has done and continues to do excellent work in Asheville. I don't know that this is a requirement. He does not live in Asheville or Buckingham County anymore. And I think it's difficult, I have a difficult time justifying giving that award to someone who's maybe not a resident, I don't know that that's a requirement, but when there are resident candidates, yeah. I could support that logic. Well, and Dale's been working in the community for so long, yeah. I think, too. Um, and so that's all you need to do for that, too, is if everyone agrees on one person, you just, someone say, I recommend that this person be the... I'd like to move that Dale Wayne Slesser gets uh, receives the Historic Resources Champion Award for 2023. Three. I second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So much better than my ridiculous. Then that's a nice segue into my last thing, and then I'll stop talking. Um, the Griffin Awards are on the 25th, I think, yes, Thursday the 25th at 5.30 at the Hideaway on Broadway. Um, the Preservation Society has kindly asked if you all want to attend 
free of charge, which includes dinner and drinks. Ooh, yes. yes. Yeah. Even if you're not a member, to please yes. join. Um, we're trying really hard to keep, you know, forging our relationship and making our partnership stronger. And we've kind of gotten a disconnect over the pandemic a bit, so we're, we're, we're trying to get that going again. So um, I told um, I told Jesse, the director, that I would just circle back with her on who was planning to attend. So I'll just send out a follow-up email tomorrow, and you can just respond to me and say yay or nay, and I'll put your name on the list. And I know you were planning to be there to present on dun, behalf dun, of the dun, commission. So your first um, official act. That's my first act. Do I don't have contact for Dale. Can you coordinate him contacting, being in touch with me so I can, I mean, he's obviously a member and will probably be there anyways, but I. He, I think he usually is, and I, I think I do actually have contact information from him. Okay, well, if you don't, I can, sure. project, you know. I, I can probably get it. I'm sure I can get it from Will or Jesse or somebody, any number of people I can. I wanted to have a thing to thank you for putting together the thing at the Masonic Temple that was super informative, yeah. super helpful, yeah. and really um, package it up. And uh, but it really helped understand how we work as a commission and how uh, it can go awry sometimes. <laughs> um, but, uh, you guys are pretty good at keep. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We were on tight ship here, um, but thank you. I appreciate that. It was. Thank you for doing that. Um, it was. It was. It was. It was great. Yeah. And I know it was a lot of work for you and for Avery yeah, to uh, it was get that projector that didn't good. work very well. <laughs> oh gosh, that was going to drive me nuts. Yeah. Um, if you weren't there, we had this projector that the bulb was going bad and we were in a dark theater and so you couldn't see the screen you could just see the screen like you're looking at a bad like you're trying to do a reading so test bad. an eye test <laughs> yeah, and you couldn't no, no. quite read it and so anyways um but it was a great event and that is one great thing about us being a clg is it was almost fully funded by clg grant money so um well keep keep your, doing um AI? Awesome. That. Oh, it was wonderful. For Josie Ward and I, the author of the landmark designation report and the National, Nom National Register nomination, we were invited to present by Maria to the AIA um, chapter group at their luncheon a couple weeks ago, which was really lovely because they were so engaged and asked a lot of questions, which made me really happy because I, the last thing I want to do is stand in front of a bunch of people and then just like... <laughs> When is she going to stop? It's every meeting I have to do. It's just me talking. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It it heartens me, I think, to know that there's such interest in preservation of spaces like Walton Street. Um, and so that's, it was it was a really good yeah. good day. So of, Even our president said that was one of the most uh, robust discussions that we've had, you know, following a section meeting, presentation like that's great. And That's the only awesome. thing I feel terribly about is that poor Alex went through the whole presentation and didn't even have a chance to eat lunch. <laughs> and I felt terrible. About you should that. not feel I terrible. Didn't eat either. Just so bring yeah, I get, I get too nervous when I have to do a presentation yeah. like that, anyways. I, I was so. hoping we'd have time afterwards, but you said you had to run, and I didn't want to. Yeah, it's okay. I, but I appreciate the, the invitation. It was really nice, and hopefully, we can have another topic that's of interest to you all again and maybe bring a commissioner along next time. I tried really hard and I don't go to a lot of the AIA luncheons. Mm -hmm. That was one I very much wanted to go to and then here we are. Not well, we know none of you are busy at all, so, you know. <laughs> Does anybody else have any other yeah. business or thoughts? Ridiculous computer. Oh, it turns. <laughs>